Okay, we're live on YouTube. Okay, good morning. Welcome to the April 13th, 2021 public hearing, public meeting of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. I will call the roll. Chair Carroll? Here. Commissioner Bland? Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Commissioner Shamir Barron, you're on mute. Here. Thank Here. you. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Here. Commissioner Devonshire? Here. Commissioner Goldblum? Here. Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Here. Commissioner Lutfi? Who I see is connecting. Commissioner Lutfi? Uh, here. Thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Here. Okay, we're all set. All right, good morning and welcome to the April 13th public hearing and public meeting. Today, we will start the day with a public meeting agenda to review applications for work on designated properties that have already had a public hearing and for which we have already heard testimony and given comments. And they are returning today with revised designs in response to those comments. The second part of our agenda will be the public hearing agenda. And this hearing and meeting are being held via Zoom and live streamed on YouTube. So if you'd like to watch the proceedings, please visit our YouTube channel to watch the live stream. And if you would like to testify on any of the hearing items, please join the hearing or the webinar at the estimated time for that item as shown on our hearing agenda, which can be found on our website. And so with that, I will turn it over to Corey Harala, our Director of Preservation, to lead us through our agendas. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. We'll start uh, with the public meeting items as stated, uh, and I'm going to read in two items together as they involve the same property. It's items one and two, uh, both involving 175 Fifth Avenue, the Flatiron Building Individual Landmark and the Ladies Mile Historic District. Uh, this is in the borough of Manhattan, block 851, lot one. The first stock and number is LPC 21-02537, an application for a certificate of appropriateness. And this is a Beaux-Arts style skyscraper designed by D.H. Burnham and Company and built in 1902 to 03. The application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of storefronts and louvers. And the second docket number is LPC 21-01234, also an application for a certificate of appropriateness. This application is to replace entrance infill, modify the penthouse, and install mechanical equipment at the roof. These ap applications were last presented at the public hearing of October 20th, 2020, and no action was taken at that time. The staff will be presenting the revisions to the proposal this morning. And Elizabeth, you have control of the presentation. You can begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Elizabeth Fagan, preservation staff. As Corey mentioned at the public hearing of October 20th, 2020, the commissioners reviewed a scope of work at the Flatiron Building including replacement of entrance infill, modifications to storefront infill and louvers as part of a master plan, and work at the penthouse, including modifications to window openings, extending the parapet, installing mechanical equipment, and replacing stucco. The commissioners were supportive of the changes to the penthouse openings, parapet enlargement, and mechanical equipment, and therefore this portion of the scope is not included in today's presentation. The revisions you'll see today are in response to the commissioner's comments regarding the entrance infill, storefront and louvers, and color of the stucco at the penthouse. Uh, so the first revision is at the entrance infill at the Broadway and Fifth Avenue facades. Uh, on the left, you'll see the historic entrance infill. In the center is the replacement infill installed by the 1950s, and on the right is the current infill installed by the 1980s. At the public hearing in October, the applicants proposed installing new formed bronze infill featuring paired doors at Fifth Avenue and revolving doors at Broadway with building signage and an open glazed transom. Most commissioners commented that the large expanse of glazing at the transom should relate more to the historic infill by introducing mullions to better recall the historic conditions and a few commissioners supported the idea of possibly reintroducing grill work. And here's another view of that previously proposed infill. And in response to the commissioner's comments, the applicants have revised the proposal to inclu include vertical mullions at the transoms, which you can see here. 
And here is another review, uh, another view of the revised proposal with the added transom mullions. Uh, these mullions align with the sides of the doors at each facade. Uh, the next revisions come at the storefronts where the applicants have responded to the commissioner's comments regarding the installation of new louvers over time as tenants lease the space. Uh, here you can see the existing storefront conditions. Note the large existing louvers uh, at the storefront transoms adjacent to the Broadway and Fifth Avenue entrances. Shown here are the existing conditions at the top, the previously proposed in the middle, and the new proposal at the bottom. At the public hearing, some commissioners commented on the perceived heaviness of the louvers, and the applicants have responded by proposing all partial height louvers at both the Fifth Avenue and Broadway facades, including modifying the existing louvers adjacent to the entrances. At the West 22nd Street facade, the proposal remains the same and the commissioners did not comment on this facade. And here again, you can see the existing previous and new proposal at Broadway, which is the same as Fifth Avenue. Uh, next, I will move to revisions at the storefront infill. At the public hearing, the applicants proposed modifications to storefront infill to meet ADA requirements. Over time, almost all of the cast iron storefronts had been modified and reassembled in some way, including the installation of side lights next to the doors, which had been approved by the commission in years past. The storefronts with side lights are outlined here in red, and in the blue are existing storefronts that do not currently have a side light and do not meet ADA requirements. At the public hearing, the applicants proposed modifying all storefronts without a side light to include a new side light, which you can see here. And the commissioners requested that the applicant explore options that would eliminate the need for a side light, such as power assisted doors, rather than modifying the storefronts further. In response to this request, the applicants found that ADA requirements can be met by installing automatic door hardware and actuator buttons without having to modify the existing storefront infill, uh, which you can see the proposal here on the right. The swing of the non-historic doors would be changed to swing out and a wireless actuator button would be installed at the mullion. And these elevations uh, just show the locations where the automatic hardware would be installed here in red. The existing storefront would remain in place um, and would not require replacement or modification as previously proposed. Uh, next, I'll discuss revisions to proposed storefront infill replacement at two locations only. At the public hearing, the commissioners reviewed a proposal to introduce new storefront infill with paired doors and flat display windows in order to provide egress to a basement tenant space. The previous proposal called for modifications at six potential locations to allow for one bay of paired doors at each of the building's three facades, which you can see here on the right. The commissioners had concerns that introducing flat fronted storefront infill at Fifth and Broadway would interrupt an otherwise fairly uniform pattern of bay fronted infill and requested that the applicant explore a design which would more closely resemble the bay fronted infill. So in response to these comments, the applicants have reduced the proposed locations of paired doors uh, to one bay at Fifth Avenue and one bay at Broadway. A new paired door infill at West 22nd Street has been omitted from the scope. As mentioned, the pair doors would provide access to a large basement retail space. And these revised locations of the pair doors are at the same bays that historically provided access to a basement restaurant space, which you can see in these two photographs. In terms of the design of the infill, the applicants are now proposing bay fronted display windows in lieu of flat and shifting the pair doors to the side. The intent is to reconfigure the existing cast iron infill or use in-kind replacement where needed. And here you can see that proposed location of the paired door infill at each facade.
And lastly, I'll go over revisions to the color of the stucco at the penthouse. Uh, currently, the stucco at the penthouse is in a lighter finish, and this has been previously replaced. At the public hearing, the applicants proposed a cream colored stucco, which some commissioners commented that this color appeared too bright. Other commissioners commented that the color would mute the reading of the building silhouette against the skyline uh, and requested that the applicant consider a darker stucco shade. Uh, so in response, the applicants have returned with a darker neutral beige color shown here. Uh, and here you can see in elevation the existing stucco color, the previously proposed and the newly proposed. And finally views from Madison Square Park showing the existing stucco on the left, the previously proposed in the middle and the newly proposed darker shade on the right. Uh, so that concludes the revisions and the applicants are here as well to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Commissioners, do we have any questions for the applicant or Elizabeth? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Rich, do we receive any written uh, comments on this revised proposal? Yes, we did. We received uh, comments from Historic Districts Council uh, still in opposition. Okay, all right. Um, any final questions, commissioners? All right, and would the applicant like to make any final comment before we move into our discussion? Uh, it's Rich Metzke. Uh, no, I think we're fine. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we'll, we'll just move right into our discussion. And I actually didn't open the hearing, uh, but since he didn't comment, I think we're okay. <laughs> um, op open the proceedings for him. But um, I just also want to note for the record that Commissioner Bland is recused on this item and has been absent for this entire presentation. Um, and, and thank you, Elizabeth, for a very clear presentation. I think that may be why we didn't have any questions. I think you laid it out really clearly. Um, the applicants have sort of addressed each of the comments that were raised at the public hearing, including adding more articulation to the transoms, reducing the louvers on Fifth Avenue, um, figuring out a way to eliminate the side lights at, um, and at the storefronts that need barrier-free access, and um, working out a solution that has a projection in the egress doors and limiting those numbers to two, and finally changing the stucco color. Um, so why don't we go ahead and have our conversation and um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, I think um, some of these were suggestions you had made last time and do, would you like to start this one? Thank you. Um, so I think that almost on all counts, um, they've addressed my concerns and, and those of others. Um, the elimination of the side light um, I think is a very positive thing, the incorporation of the bays, um, even in the case where they have a double doors, it is a good thing. The change in the color to the penthouse, um, it makes sense and, and reads well, I think. It's a little bit hard to really know for sure, but um, I think it's the right, the right decision. Um, <clears throat> louvers, I think, are very well resolved. Uh, the only thing that I still have a little bit of a concern about and would like to hear others' thoughts uh, is in the um, uh, the half round transom and their decision to or, or f final kind of choice to go with those two vertical um, elements rather than something sort of a little bit more elaborate um, uh, as the precedent would show. I mean, there are obviously lots of different examples of, of what's been there before. So I'm open to, to further thoughts, but I'm not sure that I'm completely um, convinced by how they've resolved that. So that's my only concern. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford-Smith. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I agree with um, most all the comments of um, <clears throat> Commissioner Shamir Barron. I think the storefront infill, maintaining the bays without the side lights and then introduce the reintroducing the bays with the double doors um, are all very appropriate. And I think the stucco color 
appears to be much, uh, a much better color choice than the previous one. Um, and the louvers are, uh, the reduction of the louver size is, is definitely an improvement. Um, I was also a little, um, I guess, underwhelmed by the decision on the transom over the entries. Um, and, you know, I understand that there's you know, been a lot of changes over time, and this is a somewhat of a uh, return to a nod to what was there before. Um, just looking, and I understand that they might not want to add the grill because that would, you know, introduce a heaviness that no longer exists in the overall design of this of the entry. But there is an opportunity, I think, to add a little more more mullions to to sort of you could bring back the mullion pattern and not the grill, and that would have a little more texture that might um, just improve the the transom. So. Okay. I'd be interested to see what other people think about it. Okay, that, that may be a, a good uh, sort of set of directions for them. Commissioner Chapin? Yeah, I completely agree with the comments of uh, my two colleagues uh, and yours as well, uh, Commissioner. But uh, I also uh, felt that the uh, something much closer to uh, the grill would be better. I do think this is uh, better than what was presented originally. And I think on most, on all the other counts that they've done the right thing. I mean, perhaps as uh, Commissioner Hopefrey Smith is suggesting more millions or even a very light grill that would uh, give a little more texture, but would still pr you know, permit uh, lots of light. Uh, would be a possible, but anyway, uh, I agree with my uh, fellow commissioners. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. I'm actually okay with it as is, but I think that Anne's ideas would make it better. Uh, and so I, and I would totally support that too. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, they satisfactorily met all of our uh, requirements, but I, I agree with uh, Anne's comments about the transom as well. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, yeah. for the comments, uh, this is much improved over last time. I like the, the color of the stucco getting closer uh, and, and uh, Hope Smith's uh, comment is right on. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lefty. Uh, I agree. Um, I think they've all the changes have been smart and thoughtful and have made uh, you know, made it made a, a good difference in the project. I, I, I want to say I'm happy. I'm fine with it as is. I, I um, in terms of the transom, I, I thought about it a lot. And in looking at it, I, I felt as though they, um, I like the way they can, they continued the line from the door frames all the way through um, in terms of the mullions. And in some ways, you know, I, I was thinking about this issue of the grill's beautiful from the original. And I was thinking, gee, it would be lovely to have it. And then I thought, you know, we're in a different place in time. And one thing that happens when the mullions come up is that your eyes do go to the transom. And then what you end up doing is looking at the culprit ceiling. And I felt like that was also a, a terrific design. All that said, if everybody, all the commissioners feel like some extra work has to be done, I'll, I'll support that. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I agree with Anne's comments. I think if the, the grill was lighter, not so heavy, it would add tremendously to the, uh, it, it would work very well. And the rest of the project, I think, is very well thought through. Okay. And Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine with it as is, um, but I do agree with uh, Commissioner Holford Smith's comments. Okay. All right. So I think what we have is a majority of people who would like to see them continue to work with the staff on the um, transom configuration. And I think, you know, we have to recognize that the two two entrances are different. So um, 
the solution might have to be tweaked a bit for each side because you have a, a double door and a revolving door. But I think if we're all comfortable with the staff um, working with them to add a little more articulation based on the historic um, precedent, then um, we can go ahead and vote to approve with that modification to continue to work with staff. So, um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you be able to make the motions? There are actually two of them. In the matter of LPC 2102537, that's 175 Fifth Avenue, the Flatiron Building, an individual landmark Ladies Mile Historic District. Um, a Beaux Arts style skyscraper designed by D.H. Burnham and Company and built in 1902 The application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of storefronts and louvers. I note that the building storefront infill has changed over time and that the commission has issued permits for various storefront alterations since designation. I also note that while the existing cast iron infill appears original or historic, portions of this infill may have been relocated or replaced in kind. And I recommend approval finding that the storefront infill at most or all of the bays has been replaced over time and several have been changed in terms of composition of elements. Therefore, the proposed work will not alter an intact and unified composition of historic infill. But the proposed new storefront infill with paired doors with, will feature bay fronted display windows, thereby harmonizing with the existing pattern of projecting bay windows at the Broadway and Fifth Avenue facades and, and will reuse existing cast iron infill components or replace these elements in kind to match the historic. That the proposed automatic door openers and actuators will be discreet and require only minimal intervention at the cast iron mullions and non-historic wooden doors. The proposed louvers will be simply designed, typical in placement, well scaled to the storefronts and finished to blend with their context and that the establishment of a master plan will help maintain a unified appearance at the building base in keeping with the design of the building. So I note here, um, that the applicant will work with staff. Oh, actually, it's the next one, Adi. Okay, sure. So this one's just the storefront. So we'll we'll go ahead and vote on this one. And, and Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay. Rich, will you call the vote on this one? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, thank you. So that's the storefront master plan, and I apologize for not giving more clear direction. So the next one is for the entrance infill and the penthouse and the mechanical equipment. All right. In the matter of LPC 2101234, 175 Fifth Avenue, Flatiron Building, individual landmark, latest mile historic district, a Beaux Arts style skyscraper designed by D.H. Burnham and Company. I get excited just saying that. And built in 1902 <laughs> The application is to replace entrance infill, modify the penthouse, and install mechanical equipment on the roof. Um, I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or conceal any significant architectural features, that the proposed bronze clad entrance infill will feature configurations, materials, details, profiles, and finishes, which will recall aspects of the historic bronze entrance infill, which existed at three bays. And the proportions of the proposed entrance infill, as well as the presence of tall paired doors at the Fifth Avenue entrance and revolving doors at the Broadway facade will be compatible with the historic proportions of the ground floor and will subtly acknowledge these installations as modern infill. That the modifications to the penthouse and the proposed rooftop mechanical equipment will only be seen from public thoroughfares at a distance. That the penthouse will maintain a simple profile and only be moderately increased in height. And the HVAC equipment will not be more than minimally visible in the most prominent views of the building from the north, thereby not detracting from the silhouette of the building in views from public thoroughfares. That the simple design and neutral finishes of the penthouse and rooftop mechanical equipment, as well as their setback placement in relation to the building's facades will further help them remain secondary to the significant architectural features of the building and that the curvature at the north end of the penthouse will be a subtle change which will relate well to the historic curved corner of the building uh, and um, that in reference to the entry 
um, the, the uh, transoms over the entry doors. The applicant will work with staff to um, refine the details and to better um, approximate the, um, the grill details that were previously um, installed in the building and um, perhaps with a more simplified or thinner um, line. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. Okay, and Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Can, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Aye. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. All right, with 10 in favor and unopposed, the motion carries. All right, so that's approved with that modification. So can, please continue to work with the staff on the articulation and uh, configuration of the transom. And we'll move to the next item. We'll do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, public meeting item is item number three. LPC 21-05867, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan block 572 lot 41, 14 to 16 Fifth Avenue in the Greenwich Village Historic District. This is an apartment house originally constructed in 1848 to 49 as two Gothic revival style row houses. The application is to demolish the existing building and construct a new building. Uh, please note that at the public hearing of March 9th, 2021, a plurality of commissioners were supportive of demolition of the existing building. However, some commissioners were against demolition while the rest were undecided. Most commissioners were supportive of the design for the new building, but asked the applicants to reduce the height and to restudy the design and details of the visible lot line facades. Additionally, one commissioner asked for the brick color to be refined to a buff color rather than gray. Those commissioners that were undecided on the question of demolition asked the applicants to provide more information on the condition of the existing building. With that, the applicant team is here to respond to these comments with a revised proposal after we open the proceedings. All right, thank you. So commissioners, I'm just requesting to unmute all of you so we can have a motion to open the proceedings. So Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the applicant may now speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Drew Hartley from Atchison Doyle Partners Architects. Um, and our presentation today is, is broken down similarly to our previous presentation. Um, first, we're gonna discuss the demolition application. And then second, uh, Paul Whalen from Robert Amstern Architects will discuss the proposed building. So um, next slide. So as far as the demolition um, application is concerned, we, we want to reiterate or review some of the key points of the previous presentation, and then provide some additional information about the existing building. Next. So um, just like uh, several commissioners mentioned, we agree that several people have lived in this building over time, but that that is not, um, different than many buildings in Greenwich Village or New York City for that matter, and that no culturally or historically significant events have occurred in the building. Um, next, so the, this exists, sorry, previous slide. Um, the existing building is a small five-story apartment building. Um, the exterior is void of significant historic fabric, and the exterior is void of detailing that's emblematic of a particular style. Um, if this building um, occurred in, in one of the other uh, historic districts that's a little bit newer, it would be considered a no style building or a non contributing building. Um, the building was altered in 1937 to its current form, um, but that alteration uh, in itself is not uh, significant enough in, in a way or in a style that's worthy of, of preservation. So it's been in the current condition for 84 years, so roughly it's the same amount of time that it was in a previous condition. It's been uh, in this condition as a five-story small apartment building. Next. 
So looking at the context, Lower Fifth Avenue, we have a photo on the left looking north from 9th Street and a photo on the right looking south from 9th Street. You can see um, the existing building on the right where the white arrow is. So since the early 20th century or specifically since 1916 um, with the introduction of the New York City zoning resolution, um, only tall apartment buildings have been built along Lower Fifth Avenue. Um, the zoning resolution ushered in um, higher uh, FAR requirements or allowances at this part of Lower Fifth Avenue, um, and it became common for larger apartment buildings to be built. And you can see all of our uh, neighboring buildings and that we reviewed in the previous presentation are larger, taller apartment buildings. Um, and the developing a small apartment building or like our building is today, a five-story apartment building is, doesn't meet the development patterns of Lower Fifth Avenue. Um, Greenwich Village Historic District was established in 1969 um, and the scale of development along Lower Fifth Avenue was, was well established at, at that time. Next. And during our previous presentation, um, we had several examples of buildings that had been approved for demolition um, in Greenwich Village Historic District. 25 Bleecker Street is probably the closest ex example of, of a building that is, uh, has a lot of the similar characteristics as 16 Fifth Avenue. And the commission uh, noted in the certificate of appropriateness for this building um, for, for 25 Bleecker Street, that it retains no significant historic fabric that represents the federal style, um, nor the later significant phases of development. So um, no significant historic fabric. That is uh, the same example that we have on 16 Fifth Avenue. Um, 16 Fifth Avenue retains no significant historic fabric that represents uh, the Gothic style in, in 16 Fifth Avenue's case. And the, the later, uh, the conversion of the buildings in 1937 and 16 Fifth Avenue's case does not reflect a significant phase of development or architectural style. So very similar to this building, this building was approved for demolition and replacement. Um, and for those reasons, we feel that 16 Fifth Avenue um, is also a candidate for demolition. Next. So next we wanted, there was comments at the, at the previous hearing um, about the exterior uh, condition of the building and the interior condition of the building. And we wanted to provide additional photographs and, and a little bit more uh, information about the building itself. Next. So it, it was commented um, in the previous hearing that the building was in poor shape or rough shape. So we wanted to zoom in on that and give you Give you more information. So the photo on the left is the existing front facade. Um, you can see the fire escape going up the middle of the building. Um, the windows on the building are a mix of uh, wood windows, um, single pane wood windows. You can see a detail of that on the right. And then some of the windows on the front facade and rear facade are aluminum windows. The wood windows um, are fairly deteriorated. They're single pane windows. Um, some of them open, some do not, um, but uh, they're, they're in poor condition. Next. Um, the photo on the left is a typical window sill, um, square profile, no detailing, no, um, no profiles uh, to, its, to its detail. Um, it's covered over with uh, cementitious stucco um, and uh, it's very simple and plain in its detailing. And the photo on the right is, this is actually looking into one of those uh, light shafts that's cut through the building. Um, but this is a typical aluminum window that occurs both on the front facade and, and other places in the building. So just a reminder that these light shafts, I think there's, there are three of them total. This is the large one and then there are two smaller light shafts that are cut through the building that really reconfigure the interior uh, space of the building. Next. Um, the roof uh, has several layers of roofing. Um, it has uh, tested positive for uh, asbestos. Um, there are, were active leaks. You can see that the, there was a waterproof coating that, that went over the brick on the bulkhead. Um, they were trying to uh, repair active leaks and 
it appears as though that waterproofing uh, took off the face of some of those bricks as it uh, stripped itself off of the bulkhead. So there's a lot of repairs that need to happen on this building. And another one of the light wells, um, the photo on the right is looking from the roof, looking down um, one of those spaces. There are two that are, that are about this size. And the photo on the left um, is interior looking into one of those light shafts. I think the camera actually uh, made this look quite good and, and bright in the interior shot that they're actually quite dark. Um, and those light shafts don't really uh, give that much light to the interior spaces. Next. And then looking further on the interior of the building, um, it was interesting that, that uh, some of the commissioners know this building or have been in the interior of this building. Um, we also just wanted to give a little bit more information about the interior condition. Next. So starting on the left photo uh, is the, the basement entry door, um, simple entry. You move into the entry hall and to the common corridors and they have been um, renovated over time with, with stone, but nothing historically significant about the interiors. Next. The, the common stair hall um, and elevator um, have uh, simple finishes, paint on the walls, uh, nothing historically significant to these uh, VCT tiles or, or the plastic laminate of, of the elevator. And the apartments are in various uh, degrees of renovation. Um, some have been renovated like the one on the right. Some um, were renovated at one point, but, but they've really fallen into disrepair like the one on the left. Um, but in both cases, um, simple detailing and uh, there's really nothing in this building um, that references back to um, a previous life. And I will hand it off to Paul Whalen now. Thank you, Drew, and good morning, uh, commissioners, chair Carroll, and staff. Uh, thank you for seeing us again this morning. Uh, we very much appreciated all the comments that you gave us, uh, both in our last formal meeting and in our informal session uh, with staff. And. Um, uh, I just want to iterate, reiterate how excited our office is to be working again in a historic district. Uh, it's something we love to do and that we're often hired to do in uh, cities all over the country, actually. And also, uh, Bob Stern very much wanted to be here today. Uh, he's really supportive of the changes that we've made uh, uh, based on the comments that you gave us, and, uh, but he's teaching a class. And so he's very disappointed to not be able to make it here today as he, as he did last time. So if you could go to the next image, please. So we're just gonna jump right into it and show you where we were before and where we are now. Uh, here in an uh, aerial view from the Southeast, you see where we were before. Uh, and on the right, we have uh, reduced the building by 18 feet, the equivalent of two floors by re-sculpting the top. Next, please. Now, we have also uh, uh, responded to a couple of other comments, which included simplifying the south facade uh, to make it more look more like a party wall and less uh, like something that might make somebody think that this is a corner building. There was also a uh, concern that perhaps the top was too complicated. Uh, and so we took this, uh, let's see, excuse me, I'm gonna draw on here. We took this element and removed it, as you can see on the right, uh, we created a, a, a simple, uh, uh, lovely sort of a two stories, a kind of an attic or a freeze element at the top of the building, which starts to connect in a very clear way to the street wall of our neighbor to the north. Uh, what I think that also does is, whereas before you might have thought that all this was the top of the building, we have now, by both reducing the building by two floors and by raising up that first gesture, have created uh, a, a top that's much smaller than what it used to be and more of a clear street wall. So we go to the next image, please. And then here we are looking from Southwest, uh, where we were before, uh, what we've removed on the right. We've removed not only height, but we've also created additional setbacks uh, to make sure that we still have the kind of stepping that we liked in the previous scheme. Next, please. 
and here it is without without all the, all the diagrams. You've also added a couple of uh, metal uh, uh, sort of porch-like elements at the top of the building to help break down the scale at the top, and they're almost like uh, additions that it might have been added onto a penthouse. And and very typical we find in the, in uh, how buildings develop over a period of time in New York. Sometimes, of course, they're incorporated from the very start. Next, please. And then here uh, from Washington Square North, looking up on the left where we were before, on the right, uh, you can see there's more sky around at the top of the building. Uh, again, we've come down the equivalent of two floors and the, the greatly simplified south facade, um, uh, uh, not to be confused with the corner building. Um, and uh, we've, and of course the simplified corner which allows what reads like the top of the building to start at a higher level. Next, please. And here we are uh, from 10th Street looking downtown where we were on the left. I think we always had a very nice series of setbacks that allowed the height of the building to sort of pull back from the street wall, but now that has all been lowered by 18 feet. Uh, uh, allowing it to fit in even uh, better than it did before. Next, please. And there was a recommendation that, uh, that we go for a warmer brick. What we had before was, uh, I think it was, the, they're still, they're both buff colored, but uh, the buff that we had showed you before was leaning towards gray. There was a suggestion that we that we warm it up and lead, lean more towards the kind of buff buildings that are typical of the street, for instance, number one, Fifth Avenue. And so we're proposing a mix similar to what you see on the right, uh, clearly much warmer than what we had before. The limestone remains the same. Next, please. And then here uh, to look at the elevations uh, where we were before and on the right, uh, the, our, our, our elevation that is 20 feet lower uh, and just pointing out sort of the clarity, I think, of uh, this top sort of relating uh, over here to our neighbor to the north. We've also, in, get, in removing this corner element, we have, uh, we've added a, a stronger cornice line right here with a series of metal balconies to celebrate that transition between the main part of the building and the kind of freeze or attic story. We've also added uh, one more floor of these little French balconies, and we've raised the level of this balcony to rebalance the, um, the, the, the um, kind of sculptural qualities on the building and, uh, uh, and, and work better with the overall scale that we're trying to achieve. Next, please. And uh, looking from the south, uh, again, on the right, where we have removed mass. Uh, this area down here, by the way, we're showing in red because we created a setback where there was no setback before. So where this was up here before, it is now here. And then we have a floor lower and we have, uh, we have a balcony there with this um, metal structure pushed back from the edge. Um, next, please. Then, I'm oh, sorry, just to go back one second. Uh, uh, sort of just, just again, the, the, the much simplified south elevation as requested by, by you all. Uh, we still do have a little bit of trim going around these three openings to create a sense of a little bit of focus on that facade, but much more, much more subtle than what we showed you before. Next, please. And then from the west, uh, the, uh, the, the main part of the building is same, remains essentially the same. We have a, a lot of lovely apartment buildings going all the way down into the center of the court. Uh, and here you can see sort of how much mass we took, not just from the top, but from the sides of the building so that we still have the nice stepping that we showed you before on the left. And there we are uh, with that elevation. Again, the equivalent of two stories lower. Okay, and then from the north, um, uh, here uh, the, the building is, is more or less disguised really when you're on the street by, um, by number 25th Avenue, but looking up, we have re reduced the height by, uh, by 18 feet. Next, please. Now, this is a, a diagram that I think is really important. I think that it's so important to remember 
that when we talk about scale, we talk not just about the block that this building sits on, but the surrounding blocks. And I think that this is a very interesting diagram that shows in red the outline of the buildings behind you as you look west to see the elevation of the, uh, of the building that we're proposing today. And you can see that the, the, uh, with your recommendation, our lowering of the building by 18 feet brings us within three feet of the tops of the two uh, water towers on top of the Brevort. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you were to put those two water towers together, they would be wider than uh, what we're showing at, uh, when, than our building, which is about 50 feet. That there is, put those together, they'd be about 60 feet. So our impact on the skyline is really very similar. I mean, I think it's it's less than than what the uh, the impact that the Brevort has on the skyline. And of course, number one fifth is allowed to uh, to uh, to uh, climb up to uh, to be the uh, the center of attention here. So I just want to sort of just draw a line across here, showing that sort of the again the top we're proposing now the top of the reward and also the top of number two, Fifth Avenue all work together in a very reasonable way. This is a street of buildings that go up and down. There's not, there, it is a street of juxtapositions. There are no sort of continuous street walls everywhere, but it is an assemblage of different heights that because of the beautiful, the mostly beautiful classical detailing holds together. And because uh, whether you're looking on the same block or across the street, there's a general sense of a group of buildings that work together as a family. And I think that that is what we've accomplished when we're showing you this revised scheme, again, very much based on your feedback, um, uh, your uh, valued feedback that we received the last time we were meet, that we met with you. Um, next, please. Nope, let, let me erase this. Uh, okay. And then here we are looking across the street at, at say, at, at the Brevort with um, what we're doing. And I think what's interesting is that in speaking of scale, that the, the, the urban composition that is created by uh, the building that we're proposing today with its surrounding buildings is actually so much lighter and more airy than the Brevort itself right across the street. If you look at all of this, um, which the sort of, sort of additional um, uh, weight uh, that our neighbor across the street brings to the street an additional sort of stuff that blocks light and air. Uh, I think that what we're doing today um, with existing buildings is, is something that actually is much lighter and airier than, than that building and than number two, and, uh, and actually much more in keeping with the, uh, uh, our neighbors up and down the street. In fact, I'm really convinced that, that um, uh, if this building were to be built today, that visitors, a lot of people have commented that, oh, we have to be very careful because so many visitors come to the village and they're here for the charm of the village. And we're quite sure that when this building is built, that uh, I, I, have to, I wish there, I need to put a, a subjunctive in there. You know, I wish there was a clear subjunctive in English. Would it be, should it be built? Um, that uh, this building would really feel like a part of charming Greenwich Village and it would really feel like perhaps like it's been there a longer time than it has. And uh, frankly, I think that people would be taking pictures of this building and posing in front of it, uh, perhaps more than they would in front of many other buildings in um, the neighborhood. So um, um, we're very pleased with where we are today. And again, we're very thankful for all the, uh, the feedback that you all have given us and uh, 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 both in our formal meeting and our, in our um, uh, work sessions with staff. Um, now, do we have another image after this? I'm forgetting. Oh yeah, our overall street uh, elevation. Again, it's a street of irregularity, uh, a street that goes up and down. There are juxtapositions of, of scale up and down, but it's the detailing that pulls everything together. I think that's what we're doing with this proposal, as you see on the left, number 16 fifth, and the shadow behind it that we've indicated on there, showing the height of the Brevort, and then below that, the Brevort showing the, the, the very small uh, sort of rise of our tower, if you were to superimpose the two on top of each other, that goes up to be about level 
with the um, uh, the the top of the, the top of the uh, water tower uh, enclosures at the Brevort. Next, please. So there we are. Uh, I thank you so much for uh, for your attention this morning, and uh, we really look forward to your comments. We think that uh, this landmark review has been great and that we've ended up with a better building as a result of all your thoughts. Great, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the very detailed and uh, clear presentation. So we do have um, some questions. Commissioner Shamir Barron, please go ahead. Thanks. I cannot remember if you had included this in the previous um, presentation but it's, it doesn't seem to be here now. So I, I wonder if, if, you, if someone has it, if those can be shared. And that, those are um, any images of the original uh, namesake, in this case, Henry Brevort's um, townhouses or brownstones that were originally built at numbers 10 to 16, as you reference them in, your, in a small note here um, it, with their Gothic detail, so on. Um, are there any images, photographs of those original two even of the, of the four? We had images in the uh, original presentation, but they, they are not in, in this uh, presentation today. Is there any chance that we might be able to call those up? It might not. If you, if you have access to them, I it would be a good thing to see them. Uh, the staff will take a look and see if we can arrange that. Thanks so much. Okay, other questions? All right, I don't see any other questions. Let's see. Rich, I know we've received some additional comments that um, have all been distributed to the commissioners, but why don't you go ahead and summarize that for sure. um, today? Yeah. So we received over 300 letters in opposition to the revised proposal, including from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, HDC Village Preservation and many residents. We also received 20 letters in support uh, including some from residents, representatives of 32BJ, the New York Building Congress, and other organizations. And just to reiterate that, all letters were shared with the commissioners prior to the hearing. Okay. All right. Any other questions, commissioners? All right. And I think we don't have questions. Corey, I don't know if we have a chance to, um, maybe if we, go to the website to look at the March, if the March 9th presentations are still up. Yeah, that's that what we're looking at now. We'll, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, find a screen capture or the presentation itself. It may just take a minute. I just need a minute to call this up. Okay, all right, fine. And I do see actually while we're waiting that um, a member of the public has raised their hand and I wanna just remind everyone that we are in a public meeting. Um, this item already had a hearing and we took uh, testimony, um, but as always with public meeting items, we welcome additional written comments. And as we've just stated, those have been received and shared with the commissioners. Okay. I believe this is the image that um, the commissioner is requesting. Okay. You're muted. Um, I I, I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Any follow-up um, question to that now that you see the photo? Yeah, so uh, I guess I, I have a question about, I mean, there is no question that it has been, that whatever was there in 1925 and images we have of it have been so significantly altered. But what is our, our position with respect to, um, I, I, I understand like when things have been altered, we, we might not, for instance, designate them as landmarks, but would we, 
because of an alter significant alteration, what is our history of approving demolition? So I think, you know, it's, it varies and it depends on the extent of the alterations and the site and the district as always, these are sort of looked at on a case by case basis um, where the commission hasn't already identified items as uh, properties as non-contributing, which started in 1981 and this district predates that. But the applicant has shown you examples of um, buildings that have been similarly altered where the commission approved demolition um, the, the, what, what, what the commission needs to do is evaluate it based on its existing condition. So, um, not on, you know, whether or not it could be restored, um, because we don't actually have the authority to compel restoration. Um, if that helps, I don't know. Right. If right. It's on its existing condition or on its, um, sort of the, the, the remnant of the historic reality, like the fact that, it, that some parts of it exist to, you know, to testify to, to, the, to the original. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure which- Yeah, I mean, I guess the question for you is whether you think that those remnants have, still have meaning, right? So for some commissioners, um, I think even on this particular building, as well as other buildings, they felt that the, that the um, remaining sort of remnants of it did not have enough meaning um, to that original design and that the amount of reconstruction of the facade to achieve it might even be inauthentic in a way, sort of the Disneyland, Disneyland argument. So I think, it, you know, maybe when we go around in the discussion and we hear some of the other commissioners that might help you to think about it some more. But, you know, there, it is, yeah. I also just want to add, I mean, the, 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 the question really before you is this, is this is nothing like it was before, right? Before it was two individual buildings historically with a certain level of detail. Now it is one building that, that, ha that, ha that shares primarily scale uh, and the windows are still there. Uh, window pattern, though it's now a completely different building. So from an appropriateness standpoint, the question is, you know, would it be appropriate to, to you know, dress this up with a cornice and window surrounds? I, you could argue that that would be appropriate. But that doesn't answer the question, is it inappropriate for this building, given that it's not something it was historically? What it is now, I think, people would be hard pressed to say it contributes to the district. Um, and um, would it be inappropriate to replace it with something, something, and, and if so, with what's being proposed? Because it's, it's, remember, this is not, this is no longer the building that it is. This, this you know, it's not gonna be sold and split up into two apartments, uh, two buildings anymore, it's one building. So it's something different. And the question is, you can say, we'll put back a corner, we'll do this, but it's not going to be a historic restoration because um, that's not what it is. So I think right. those so, are the kind of thoughts you have to think about when you're, when you're considering the application. Right. So in thinking about how, what the remaining uh, remnants are and how meaningful they are, I think one of the big things I know I would think about when I think about this is sort of the integrity of them and the fact that this building has internally been turned into a single apartment building um, with a single entrance. You know, I, it does raise that question of sort of integrity and authenticity if one were to try to restore it to uh, look like two buildings with all, you know, new materials, obviously. Uh, how, how much of um, Fifth Avenue's, you know, four or five story townhouse brownstone scale actually do we know remains remains in this piece of the block? I mean, would this be the very last? It is not the last. There on this block, um, there is another one on the corner, number ten. Right. Number 12 had previously been extended, replaced, and 
extended. Um, number 47, which I believe is the Salma Gundy Club, which is an individual landmark, which is sort of the prime example of a townhouse on this on Fifth Avenue. And then it looks like there's 57 and 59. Um, 29 is also similar, 68. So there's a little more. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, other questions? Okay, I think we're gonna start our discussion and we'll go around and, you know, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Schmier Baron, you'll continue, I think, to think about it as you hear your colleagues speaking um, on both sides of this. Um, so I'm gonna start with some of those who were supportive of the demolition last time. So Commissioner Glenn, I think you were supportive of the demolition and um, and actually felt that the building was, as previously presented, it was very contextual and um, related well to the district, but you did say that you thought it could come down a little bit. So um, perhaps if you could speak to your thoughts on both, both of those aspects now. Certainly, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I thought this morning's presentation was reaffirming, I guess, of my previous position, but um, it added weight to it. So I appreciated uh, both parts of the presentation. Um, the condition of the existing building is, um, as presented, is worse than I understood as a conditional issue. But uh, I maintain my point of view that uh, notwithstanding the uh, many um, uh, um, aspects of the testimony that suggested that because of famous people who had lived, uh, New Yorkers who had lived in this building over time that was worthy of, of a cultural uh, designation. Uh, I rejected that argument then and I continue to hold that belief. Um, the condition of the building um, has been so, as um, um, our council and you have just stated, has been so changed over time that I have no uh, difficulty at all suggesting that this building is no longer the, the building that, it, that was once there, even if a few aspects of the structure of the building may, may actually be, date from that period. Um, so demolition of this building uh, is acceptable uh, to me. Then there's a question of the, uh, the new building. And I think uh, uh, earlier in March and now uh, today, the presentation has convinced me that uh, in both ways, in, in both buildings, that um, this is a generally appropriate building. I, let me uh, speak though to the, uh, the changes that have been made uh, because I was prepared to think that they would kind of just lop off a couple of those two or three maybe floors in the, in the base of the building. Um, uh, but I think they've taken a very enlightened point of view and looked at the whole building again, which I appreciated, uh, and have, have come up with a similar but different building, which I think is more appropriate than the building, which I might've been prepared to vote for um, six weeks ago. Um, and, and why is that? And I think uh, it's, it's the issues that uh, Paul Whelan um, very beautifully addressed, uh, <laughs> starting with the color of the brick, um, a, a, a much better direction for me, a lot less dour building, more warmer building, which will blend, I think, with the general feeling of the buildings on these several blocks that are, that to me, um, designate a, a district, if not a a specific historic district, a district within Lower Fifth Avenue, which has a, a feeling of similarity. Um, the, um, the lot line building uh, to the south, I think is much improved because it's much more modest, uh, but not without uh, some skill and interest as well. And the top of the building is less exuberant. The 18 feet is, is much appreciated, uh, lowered. Um, can I see another floor taken out? Sure, I could, but wouldn't insist up, upon it. So I think this is a um, overall uh, a, a really very uh, nice infill, 
contextual building, although it's not exactly mimicking anything in the context, which is always a, a good sign, I think, of, a, of an enlightened and very talented architect. So I think that's what we have, and I'm pre prepared to support it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi, I think last time you also were supportive of demolition and um, and of the new building, even at its previous height, although you did say you could support something lower if they wanted to slightly lower it. So I wanted to hear how you were thinking now. Yeah, first I wanna, I wanna thank the applicant for uh, hearing with us all of that information about the inside of the building. It was really enlightening and, and, and really served to cement how I felt at that moment that, you know, based on the building's existing condition and the fact that it had been uh, very much altered, that I wasn't having a problem and still not having a problem with the demolition of the building. Um, uh, I, as, as I think I've mentioned in the past, I worked down here, so I spent so much time around these buildings. And um, I, 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 before I, I, I talk about how I feel it just in general, I do wanna say that I think the changes are, have been very positive. Not, uh, not only the reduction in height, um, and some of the simplification, the change in the, uh, the lightening of the palette. Um, I, I do have to say that I did like uh, the number of, I did like a little more of the setbacks because I thought it added a, some distinctiveness to the building. Now it, now it, it, it blends in a li even a little more. Um, that said, I, I think it works. I'm fine with the height. Um, but, but back to the, the point that I was going to make is that it just, when you walk down Fifth Avenue and you, as a pedestrian, and you look at that streetscape, particularly the streetscape on the side of the street, this, this lot, the width of this lot is not, it's just not that wide. And I, I really do believe that this building is going to just rise up in a very harmonious and compatible way with, um, with what's around it. And, and I, I happen to feel that really, uh, people aren't really gonna feel a difference. And to me, the, it certainly does not compete at all with 155th, which is a gorgeous, majestic building. But when I walk down the street, I'm always struck at the bulk of the Brevoort and uh, bulky at every level. <laughs> and this in no way is going to have that same kind of feeling. Um, I think there is going to be a, a, light, a lightness, and I think it's going to, you know, add to the streetscape and the and the skyline in the area. So I can support this. All right, thank you. All right, Commissioner Jefferson. Last time you were also comfortable with the demolition and felt that the building fit in very well um, with its surroundings, um, but also wondered about lowering the height. So. How are you feeling about um, the project now? I'm, I'm very comfortable with the demolition. And uh, the, uh, I'm gonna keep my critique on the, um, on the building itself. The existing, the, the first building was so elegant. I mean, the, the, it, it's such a, the, the erosion or addition of the top was really beautifully done. And I feel the second one, the, the revised one, it's a little stumpier. It, it's okay. It's fine. I can approve it. But I surely think the first one was so much more elegant. And, and uh, it, it's just beautifully picturesque. And that's my comments. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Holford-Smith, I think you also felt 
that demolition was appropriate here and felt that this site could take a tall building, um, but also wondered and, and asked that the applicants explore lowering it somewhat. So how are you feeling? Um, yes, I, I'm still um, in support of the demolition uh, based on everything I've heard in both hearings. Um, and I can support a, build, a taller building in this location. I think, um, you know, I think I actually agree with Commissioner Jefferson on the, the details of the design, but I do think that what they've come back with is more appropriate to this location. I think it, it feels much more like a mid-block building, a little more subdued. Uh, the lower height is, is definitely more appropriate. I, I could still see them losing another floor and make, that might bring it down a little bit, even, you know, nestle in a little bit better. But I think all the changes they've made have been very positive. Um, the change of the brick and the sort of simplification of details, I think for this location are appropriate. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, Commissioner Chapin, I think you also, um, well, I think you were still sort of on the fence and um, ask the applicants for more information about the existing to be able to fully decide whether you were comfortable with demolition. And then also in thinking ahead, um, if you could support it, I think you felt the building should be shorter as well. So how are you feeling now? Oh, did she step out? She's muted. Yeah. You're muted. You're muted, Commissioner Chapin. Thank you. Yeah, I was looking for the mute button. <coughs> um, I, I, I'm finding this one very difficult because uh, it is quite true that the building has really lost its character, except for the windows and the general massing. At the same time, uh, I feel, um, you know, we just recently saw another building <coughs> in Harlem that it kind of lost everything, uh, you know, of its distinct uh, character, but was a beautiful uh, new addition in the same scale and uh, <coughs> trying to return the building pretty close to what it was originally. So I'm feeling rather uncomfortable with the demolition of this particular uh, building in this neighborhood. Uh, with regard to the uh, structure, if demolition is approved, I feel like uh, its original design was, I, I, I actually think, uh, was uh, more attractive. Um, but just this is, I think, could be appropriate. Uh, but I still find the scale of the new building, I would like to see it at least as low as the adjacent building, and ideally as a transitional building that kind of went, it was between the, the two structures next to it. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. I, I think I'm not comfortable right now with voting for demolition. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. And Commissioner Chen, I think you were also kind of on, still undecided on the demolition and um, wondered if you had any further thoughts after listening to today's presentation. Yeah, I, I think yeah. compared to the compared to the previous hearing, uh, I'm leaning toward uh, it's appropriate for demolition, uh, like the previous commissioners uh, that have spoken. Uh, I do agree with several of the comments, uh, even though uh, uh, you know, like Anne Hofstra Smith and uh, Diana Chapin. Uh, I also find that this is my own personal view that in trying to tweak it, make it more blend or more blend in. Uh, we lost some of the more unique uh, features of the the previous uh, proposal, but obviously we're not going to design by committee. And uh, so, but I do agree with Smith Smith and, and some of the comments about see if we can further uh, modify slightly uh, and in reducing the, the the height or the bulk. Okay. All right, and Commissioner Goldblum, you also, I think, were really on the fence about demolition. Um, and then in terms of the new building, you had concerns about the overall scale of it. You also were, um, raised concerns about the design of the lot line facades and the brick color. So some of those changes, I think, have been addressed. 
Um, but let's hear how you're feeling about it now. Right. Um, thank you. I I'll go I'll go in reverse order. I think that the um, lot line um, design, the south facing facade, is is much improved. Uh, I mean, look, there's there's nobody but but this office that knows uh, that knows the uh, structures, the aesthetic structures and details of of the classic New York City apartment building better than and these guys, and, and it certainly shows. Um, um, I think that you know, the lot line, the brick have all improved. The scale has gotten better. I, I agree with Diana that it, I mean, I, 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 I appreciate the analysis, but it, I, I didn't quite buy it exactly because, and I could you know go at length as to why, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I do think it's, it's still looking at the streetscape, looking at the environment. I do think that as a mass, the, the crowning portion that is set back from the street wall is um, the tallest mid-block building that I could see on the, on the, on the uh, streetscape and just in general seemed inappropriate for a mid-block narrow building. Uh, and to draw analogies with water towers and things like that that are set back significantly didn't seem particularly relevant to me. But um, I, I do think that in general, the building is appropriate, not because it's the, you know, it's, it's perfect, but because I think it's generally within the zone. Um, and I, I do have, I did think a lot about the, the, the demolition and I, and I do still have reservations about the demolition. Um, and that's because what we preserve is the, is the, the structure, right? The structure as a volume, as well as, as a compendium of details and materials. Uh, the analysis of the condition of the building to me was non-persuasive. I think that we see uh, buildings of that level of, repair all the time and it certainly isn't showing the kind of structural uh, you know ruin that would suggest that it's 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 meritorious of demolition um, and if you look at the examples shown in the district of demolitions of full buildings only one of them that were shown and there may be others that I didn't see but <clears throat> only one of them that were shown today you know, the one, the one that was shown today was that what, you know, the most similar was different for me. And I was trying to think why it was. And I think it's because they actually modified the window openings um, on, you know, over time and on, on multiple levels of, of the four floors of that building. There's only one floor left that had even the window openings. Um, so I, I, you know, and I think that the, the rhythm of Fifth Avenue, certainly of the side of Fifth Avenue, is one of up and down and up and down. And I'm not sure that the filling of it in, even though it does follow the type, you know, the morphology, the development typology of the block of the street is, you know, I don't know where, where that balance is between, you know, where are you gonna lose it? You know, are you gonna lose that sense of the undulating street wall if you fill this gap in? I, I'm, I'm just not sure about it. I, I don't feel totally comfortable with it. I, I, I'm on the fence. Okay, thanks. And uh, Commissioner Devonshire, I think you were not comfortable with demolition last time. So has mm -hmm. anything changed? I remain so. Um, I, I think Commissioner Goldblum's uh, idea about the, the <clears throat> relating um, the undulating rhythm of the of Fifth Avenue uh, becomes wiped out when these disappear. In in any case, given the the chicken little story that we were sold the last time, um, I have since gone by this building twice. Because I I think I may have mentioned I've I've taken both my UMass classes and my Columbia classes by these buildings, and had them do uh, condition assessments, uh, sidewalk condition assessments of them. 
And I, I just thought, well, these guys must be seeing something I never saw. So I went back once and was convinced that the chicken little approach was absolutely an oversell. And then doubting my own possible visual um, confirmational bias, I went back again. And, and in fact, I saw nothing to suggest that these two buildings were in dire need of uh, demolition because of some safety reasons. Uh, the, the applicant asserts that there is a stucco application on the, the buildings that, that somehow means let's knock them down. Well, I would challenge you to find more than 10% of brownstones in New York City that haven't been covered with stucco. It's the nature of brownstone to delaminate when it's face bedded, as most New York City brownstone buildings are, and uh, the solution tends to be stucco. Um, the, the idea of, of the roof having far too many layers of uh, roofing material on it is just phenomenally bizarre to me. You know, we've restored buildings, many, many, many buildings with much worse situations um, conditionally. So um, I'm left with the appearance and to me, there is enough of those original buildings to justify saving them. And in, in, indeed, in, in many cases, there are organizations that if you put the Gothic window hoods back on and you put cornices on those two buildings, and I'm, I'm calling them two buildings because that's what they were, they, they would win an award, you know, to, to, to somehow suggest that because these two buildings have been turned into one building makes them worthy of demolition. I would say, well, you know, on the Upper East Side, we've had some hedge funders come and they've taken two buildings and turned them into one. And, and we've approved that and been very happy with it. Again, a, apply some detailing to these things and they'd be getting awards from different preservation organizations. So, so that, that argument just doesn't fly with me at all. Um, so, um, yeah, the, there, some of the windows have been changed. Oh, well then let's knock the window, the, knock the windows out and let's knock the building down. I, I'm just not buying that argument at all. With regard to the design of the apartment building, it's a nicely designed apartment building. You know, that firm does nice apartment buildings, but for me, the first step is non-demolition of these two buildings that are part of this historic district. You don't preserve a landmark district by knocking down the landmarks. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson, you were here, I think for the presentation um, last time, but not for the discussion, um, but I know you, you have seen both presentations. So I wondered if you had thoughts now. Um, I, I, well, having seen both presentations, um, um, I'm going to be uh, mercifully brief. I, I, I agree with Commissioner Devonshire um, 100% in every aspect of what he said. So I really don't have anything to add. Okay. All right. Okay. So, Commissioner Shamir Barron, I think you've heard um, the commissioners talk about demolition um, from both sides. And I wonder if that's helped you to think about your own feelings here. Yeah. You know, I think that the, the, the what I'm, I'm looking at in order to get the, the most information after hearing everyone's input it is back to the um, full street renderings uh, of either side of Fifth Avenue to try to understand the thing that uh, Commissioner Goldblum described as the kind of the up and down, the, the rhythm of that, um, of the various scales. And I think that it's especially difficult because this part of Fifth Avenue is, you know, it clearly has a history of, a, of the lower scale, the, all of the, all the Brevort um, buildings after it was, you know, as he was building out his farm um, were, were this kind of fourth, five story, fourth story building. But then the, the kind of the quality of the character of this part of Fifth Avenue is also very street wall in the subsequent century. And so it's not as though 
um, you know, which aspect of that, of the historic district to retain. And the third thing to retain might be the kind of the presence of both. And so then I'm left with this thing that is, you know, that the up and down, actually that rhythm, the presentation of like the presence of both that low, his, the original, the low, super low scale, not the farm scale, but the low scale of the town, brownstones and then the street wall scale of the, of the taller apartment buildings sort of both have to be there. And so I guess my criteria for appropriateness is in fact this issue of the scale of the building in, in this block and on this, you know, several block um, kind of continuous facade. And I therefore I feel that that's, um, that retaining some aspect of this Brevort scale, of the, of the townhouse, the brownstone scale, but at the same time allowing for there to be a taller building here, but maybe not a street wall building is a sort of, a kind of a solution that I'm, I'm looking to, uh, that, that would make me feel as though we have sort of both, meaning that there would not be a full demolition of the historic building, but there too would not be a fully new um, street wall, new building. So is it possible, and I don't know that it's ours to propose, but that, that, there, that the building is, that the buildings that are there now are not in fact fully demolished. This is what I kind of thought earlier uh, the previous time, but that we permit or consider the proposal for a tall building here as well, just sort of set back from this and somehow set back or somehow with retaining some of the fabric of the, of the historic um, brown house. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an interesting idea, and then sort of how do you design the two parts together? But also because the apartment buildings really do create such a strong street wall in themselves, twentieth century street wall. I just wonder how the how you think a, a step back taller portion right. Would, right. It would relate it, to that. No, it yeah, would, it would truly be kind of another thing. And I agree that it would we'd be definitely giving that aspect up um, in, if we were in fact to do this kind of composite um, form, which was to su to some height retaining the, um, the this historic building, but also allowing for a setback of a taller. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're right. We would we would absolutely not have that experience of this this absolutely clearly. Right. Um, you know, clear example of precedent in tall buildings here. So tall street wall buildings. So it's a struggle for me, but I'm, I think I'm tending to non-demolition yeah. uh, at the same time, not, not a full right. restriction on what might be built here. Okay. All right. So I think um, we have had a really good discussion and um, not that different from last time. <laughs> So I think some of the new information um, either kind of reaffirmed people's positions or didn't persuade people to um, think about it differently. So, you know, we have several commissioners who are supportive of the building, a, a couple who would be supportive of the building if it were lowered another floor. And then I think others who are really unsure on the fence or leaning toward not supporting demolition and some that are quite sure they're not supporting demolition. So I think, um, you know, there may be a path to an approval here with six commissioners if the floor, if the building height is looked at some more and that additional floor is um, taken out and you know, how, how you resolve that, where you take that from and how you address the street wall, um, you know, would, I think, address the, a couple of the commissioners and may get you to a path to an approval. Um, and then certainly looking beyond that um, to some of the other suggestions, you know, might bring some other people along. But I, I think for many of them, demolition is a hurdle to start out with. So we'll, we'll, we don't have the votes today. We'll take no action today. And you can talk to the staff about the options for um, thinking about how to respond to the comments and, and coming back to us. All right. Thank you for a very 
thorough presentation. Thanks. Okay, and with that, we'll, uh, right. we'll transition over to our public hearing items, uh, starting with item number one, LPC 21-04770, mm -hmm. an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn block 3026 lot one, 160 Moyger Street, Williamsburg Houses individual landmark. An international style housing project designed by William Lascaz and Richmond H. Shreve, built in 1935 to 38. The application is to modify landscape elements and install murals, enclosures, and miscellaneous fixtures. And uh, commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. You now have control of the presentation and remember to unmute yourself and state your name for the record and you may begin. Good morning, this is Brian Newman from Newman Design. Um, so uh, thank you all. Um, we have here Williamsburg Houses, uh, built in 1938. Many of you may recall, we have previously presented this project as a whole, uh, specifically uh, on the window replacement um, to, to this board. Um, and today we are here uh, coming back for a, a overall site design or site improvement uh, as it relates to landscaping, some hardscape, uh, and a lot of amenities for the tenants. Um, as you see on the left-hand side, that's the, this is the original artist rendering from uh, around 1933. Um, and the aerial photo, um, sometime I'm gonna say probably in the early 40s. And let's just see, can I, can I move the slide or Edith, are you doing that? Uh, you have control of the presentation, you just have to click on the screen and then you can advance the slides with the arrow keys or the mouse. There, sorry, there's a little lag there. Thank you. Um, so here, just to refresh everyone's memory, um, four super blocks uh, to the north, Mauser Street, to the far right, Bushwick Avenue, to the far left, Leonard Street, and the southern board, Skulls. Uh, as we say, four super blocks, it's really about three and a three and a quarter or three and a third uh, in the center there between Manhattan and Graham. That's not part of our project. Uh, the, the blank space is a, a school and just below that is a city park and community center. That's not part of our scope. Um, you can see here the 20 buildings um, as originally designed, they were um, angled on a 15 degree angle from the city block. The idea here and the original intention um, for, for the design was to create, um, they used the term tower in a park. Four stories, I guess, in the 30s was a tower. A, a little bit different these days. But the idea was to have these residential multifamily buildings uh, within a park-like setting by angling the buildings at the 15 degree um, to, to the city, uh, to the streets, uh, essentially opened up um, view lines, uh, lines of sight from the apartments to, to this center, uh, center park-like area, and then essentially creating these pocket-like parks with the different, um, I'm almost gonna call them lowercase L or T-shaped building footprints help create these somewhat semi-private uh, pocket parks and then all surrounding the central park that was in the middle of the, uh, uh, of each, each individual block. So we have some, some historic photos we were able to, um, to uh, discover uh, basically late 1930s or in the 1940. You can see the four story uh, international style architectural buildings uh, opening up onto these large open landscaped areas. Um, you, you can see over time, um, essentially open expanses, some shade trees planted, uh, walkways that were open and essentially what was really just the barrier between the landscaping and the walkways were some low shrubs and, and low hedges here, uh, not fenced in. You do see some guide wires and some little pickets here. That was uh, temporary while the landscaping uh, was, was coming in and, and initially planted. But uh, you could use the top right as a reference here with a playground at the time and the, the landscaping, the shrubbery were really used as the the barrier or pedestrian controlling element. And I'll, I'll speak more about that in a little bit. Um, so I'd like to talk about hardscape 
uh, adjustments. This is really just a, an overview, very high level. We have the historic plans on the left-hand side, the current or existing conditions in the center, and on the right-hand side uh, is the proposed. What, what you really want to take from this at, at a very high level is we're really, generally speaking, and I'll get into specifics, not changing the hardscape patterns or the circulation pattern. We're respecting the original design, uh, which very closely remains today um, as far as the pathways, that central, that central area, as well as some of these parking parks. They may be underutilized today, but those areas are still some, somewhat there. Um, on the top right um, is a quick sort of reference guide, uh, and I'll get into them in more detail uh, later on in the presentation, but essentially a, a lot of amenities that we, we are going to try to incorporate back into the site to help further enhance uh, the lives of the residents that, that are there. Um, things like dog run, adult fitness, handball courts, bike, bike parking, uh, resurfacing basketball courts, uh, improving playgrounds for the children there, um, uh, adding historic murals, which I'll get into as well, and pruning existing trees. So here's the site amenity package. And when we look at this, I, I, want, it, I want the board to keep in mind or the commission to keep, commissioners to keep in mind that we're working directly with the residents right now to get a feel for exactly what they want and what would best serve the community of, of this project. Um, there's approximately 1,620 units, um, a lot of people in, in this project, um, and we wanna make sure we really give back to them and, and provide the services or the amenities that's best, best going to uh, accommodate their needs. So for instance, um, uh, on the left-hand side, active program, uh, as you can see, as I mentioned or showed earlier, uh, there were certain areas uh, on the site that were for activity. At the time, it was originally children's uh, active play or playground. Today, this is what I was alluding to before, it, it's fenced off, it's just underutilized, you really can't get over there. One of the amenities we, wanted, we, we thought uh, the tenants might benefit from was having a dog run, a, a fenced in area still, but pulled off the walkway, uh, have that landscape buffer as that original design intention and have a, an area that would be just for the dogs for their recreation and things like that. Uh, the right hand side is a key plan. There's a red star in the top right corner. That's an area where we thought it may be appropriate. This is one of the few items uh, that we did um, uh, bring to uh, the residents that there is some pushback and we may not go with a dog run. There was, there, there's some internal talks right there. And we'll have to, you know, we, we need their final input. Um, if it does not become a dog run, it would be a children's play area, which I can show later on. And these are just some of the details that would have been incorporated if that dog run uh, remained. In the center of each one of the sites, uh, as I mentioned before, um, there's the, the central area. Originally, some of it was uh, open area. Over time, they become playgrounds. Um, what we want to do is reestablish those playgrounds uh, with basically new equipment, new play areas. Um, you can see in here, uh, splash pad, pad, excuse me, splash pad was originally, not excuse, not originally, but over the years, NYCHA had put in splash pads, it's no, no longer working. So the intent is to bring those back uh, into working conditions. And you can see some renderings here and, and existing photos. The existing photos are on the left-hand side. It's sort of an underwhelming, not kept up uh, that well, uh, playground on the left-hand side. Um, Play surfaces are really not up to today's current standards. There's some asphalt that's right adjacent to some of these, uh, this play equipment. And as I mentioned before, some of the splash areas are now just covered in, you can sort of see it back in here, are covered in asphalt and no longer working. So to the right is a rendering of a new age appropriate um, uh, play, play equipment, new soft surface play um, 
fall zones and play surfaces, and then the landscaping buffers around. Again, not changing, not changing the walkways, not changing the curb work. Uh, so respecting the original design and the original layout of the master plan, but just upgrading the amenities to what today's people, uh, today's residents would need. And again, the key plan you can see over here, uh, there are six locations indicated by the red stars on the right hand side. And here's just uh, an example of uh, play equipment and the play surface itself. Uh, we, we were selecting uh, some of the blues and greens here for the play surface to uh, mimic and to relate to the blue, uh, blue tiles that are on the building uh, from the original design and that still exist today at, at those entry points. Uh, another current um, improvement that is there now is the existing basketball court, again, in that center court. Um, you can see the existing photos uh, on the left-hand side, integral part uh, for recreation for the residents there. We do want that basketball court to remain. We would like to improve upon it. We'd like to resurface it. Um, but instead of just simply, you know, painting it uh, the solid co co color and restriping it, we'd like to add artist murals to the surface itself. Obviously, we'll still paint the basketball stripes on so they can, it can be used as a court. But um, artwork uh, would be incorporated into the surface itself. That way residents from the fourth floor, third floor, or even second floor apartments when they're looking down upon the courts can appreciate the artwork. And I'll get a little bit more into the artwork, but the artwork I'm referring to is, refer is referencing back to the original artwork that was incorporated into these buildings in 1930s. So utilizing those historic murals and, and putting them in places out in the open where the residents can start to understand and start to appreciate uh, the history, uh, not only of the buildings as we mentioned earlier, and but also the artwork that was part of this project's history. Um, again, just off to the left uh, in that center court, some additional amenities right now, it's uh, an underutilized um, uh, pl playground area. Uh, we're we're working with the idea of making an adult fitness. So not only will the children have recreation, but adults should also get out uh, going along with the healthy homes and active New York. Uh, we, need to give, um, we need to give recreation not only to the, the children, but to the adults as well. And here's just a uh, quick uh, rendering of the idea. Uh, similar uh, location where original, or currently it's all fenced off. Uh, you can't get to it. We put the soft surface there. We'd have the adult fitness equipment uh, in that area. We do not need a fence around that. Uh, we would have that landscape buffer. Again, not changing the hardscape, not changing the uh, uh, curb lines or original intent of the walkways. Um, again, it's it's just incorporating sort of what what uh, was there as far as recreation coming next to the the uh, basketball court. Just a cut sheet of just examples of some of the equipment and the play surface. Um, another amenity we'd really like to incorporate here are community gardens. Again, with the healthy lifestyle for the, uh, the residents, uh, we do have a lot of open area here. Uh, we do have a lot of green space. We want the, the residents to have the ability to plant their own uh, veg uh, vegetables, fruits, and so forth. Uh, so we found areas that are just underutilized, fenced off. Uh, tenants try to, or residents try to sort of make their own gardens sort of haphazardly throughout. Um, unfortunately, very unorganized. Uh, we wanna take this opportunity to work directly with the residents association and management, dedicate specific areas um, for uh, these community gardens. They can be organized, there can be a schedule, it can be upkept. Uh, this we do anticipate probably having the, a low fence around just to keep it organized. You can see the, the uh, raised planters here in the rendering. And at this point, we anticipate uh, two locations. Um, so over here, it's the building entrance itself uh, as you approach, each building has multiple entrances, these sort of smaller courtyards that recess into the building. Over time, the landscaping you can see on the top left, the landscaping has been removed. Um, I guess NYCHA uh, has installed pavers tight against the building here. 
It really gives a cold, hard feeling uh, a, as you approach the building entrances. These, you can, you can still see the scallop shape of the original um, paver and, and that would be maintained. We simply want to remove the pavers that were infilled there and then insert uh, the appropriate landscaping um, and, and native plants uh, around these entrances to soften them up um, and respect the original design intent uh, of the hardscape itself. Essentially, we're leaving the original hardscape. We're just taking out that infill that was placed in later on. As far as site furnishings, um, on the left are the historic benches. Um, over time, they've been replaced with these blue benches and the seating areas uh, have been modified and they're not very uh, conducive to, to seating right now. We'd like to sort of uh, install, remove those, install new benches that mimic more of the international style, a little bit cleaner, uh, a, a, a little, you know, um, a little bit more appropriate architectural language to the uh, original international clean postmodern ar architectural style there. Similarly, um, plastic garbage cans throughout, we're just trying to clean that up with some additional garbage cans that are more appropriate. Uh, similarly, bike racks, as opposed to having chained all over the place with the uh, against the fences, some more postmodern, uh, very clean, uh, but bike racks to help organize the space as well. Um, as far as light, this looks like we lost the graphic here. I apologize for that. Essentially, lights, uh, site lighting. The intention is to replace all existing light fixtures. Uh, with new. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, this is about a 1938 photo. Uh, this is the best photo we could come up with um, on the original light fixture. Ideally, we would have proposed the left fixture, except the problem with the left fixture, as you can see, the luminaire or the globe hangs down and it's not dark sky compliant. We have a lot of regulations with an enterprise green um, and energy efficiency that we, we can't pollute the, the night sky with, uh, with, with uh, uh, additional light. So this is the same fixture just without that globe hanging down. It's a, it's a flat lens in here. So this is the, the fixture or the luminaire that we would be proposing. On the bottom left is over time, NYCHA has been replacing them and that's these modern LED light fixtures that don't quite mimic the, the original, uh, original architecture of that luminaire. Again, we're just replacing in kind, we're not adding. Uh, in, in this one particular case in location, right where the star is, there's an existing flagpole. Uh, the asphalt has been painted, this red, white, and blue stripe sort of rainbow theme. And here, what we'd like to do, uh, take some of the historic paving uh, detail that we, uh, that we were able to locate on the drawings, uh, place it in this one location, replace the, the flagpole with a uh, more uh, architecturally uh, significant or appropriate uh, flagpole in this location, and then just clean these pavers up and the landscaping, as I mentioned previously as well. Very, very simple, very clean flagpole. I'm going to try to go a little bit faster. This is important. The, the significant change to hardscape comes directly with these trash enclosures. There are two trash, loco two trash enclosure locations, one off Humboldt Street, that's on the left-hand side, and one off Mauser Street. The one off Humboldt Street that you, you see here on the left-hand side exists today. Uh, what, we, what we need to do after meeting with Department of Sanitation on site, we need this, this walkway, all this paving all exists, but what we need to do is close this walkway off at this point here and here with that low fence that you've seen in the other photos. So the DSNY, so sanitation can back their truck up and pick up the trash from these locations. This is the existing location. It is being expanded uh, slightly, but the, the curb work and all that's going to remain. This just needs to be expanded and we need to put these lower fences in here. And the whole reason is for security for pedestrians. Uh, sanitation is concerned about backing up and possibly having a pedestrian walk through this area. 
The gates are strictly for maintenance purposes. That's for maintenance staff. And in, in order to keep uh, pedestrian flow from these building entrances out to Humboldt, we're adding a sidewalk on either side of the building. The other trash enclosure would be off Mauser Street. It's tucked in here. There's an existing sort of, I'll call it utility parking lot for maintenance staff, underutilized, not used for the staff. This would be the enclosure. This would be the location direct off Mauser. It's tucked in this. It's not open to the courtyard at all. Uh, this is a plan view, three-sided masonry wall, open to the sky. Front would be a double gate with slats. And that's the picture of the existing enclosure in, in the middle of the, uh, in the, in the, middle of the um, courtyard off Humble Street. What we anticipate, and, and this is the uh, existing condition off Mauser Street. So it's sort of this utility parking lot and the trash enclosure would be right in here. What we will be doing for these trash enclosures, and this is a good segue back to that public art, those, uh, those trash enclosures that you see here in site one and two, those masonry walls will be painted in the artist murals that we're referencing from the late 1930s that were incorporated into these buildings that have been lost over time. Currently, currently these uh, murals are available in the Br Brooklyn Museum. We want to bring that history back into the site and make sure the residents understand that and can truly appreciate that. Um, so we're creating art parks. Oh, looks like several art parks. I'm sorry, the the uh, key plan is uh, missing there, but you get the idea of these art parks in those uh, courtyards throughout the site. About five of them, and then the murals will be painted on some of these uh, retaining walls throughout the project a number of them, about 12 locations. Again, going back to the theme, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll try to go a little bit faster here. Uh, our theme is to open it up. You could see originally, um, basically very open air over time. These red lines indicate all those low fences that have been incorporated into the site for uh, as a result of NYCHA uh, trying to control uh, pedestrian traffic. And we're really just opening it up. And the only places you'll probably see the fence are the trash enclosure and uh, the community, uh, community gardens, as I had mentioned before. These are some additional just landscaping uh, areas where we do some additional ground cover, some shade trees um, around some of those pocket parks. And here's the rendering of the dumpster enclosure. So that's the existing dumpster enclosure. Here's the idea that the, the mural would be pl placed on all three sides of that masonry to soften that experience for the residents. Again, some more pocket parks throughout, just trying to reclaim those areas so residents can actually use them. Number one, by taking the fence down. Number two, by actually planting and putting some foundation planting with the appropriate species. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, thank you very much. Apologize for going over there. <laughs> that's okay. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, <clears throat> I don't see any questions at this time. So we'll move to public oh. testimony and we might Everardo have- Everardo and, and Adi. Oh, that's, I don't see that online. Okay, so um, Everardo, why don't you go first and Adi, you can follow. Just, just a quick question on the murals. Um, historically, the murals were in the lobby and then they were removed and placed in the museum or am I, is, is that the story of the murals? So, so to clarify, they were actually in the cellars uh, of, the, uh, of the buildings. Uh, at the time when the buildings were originally designed, there was more program that was being utilized by the residents. Um, over time, they were removed, and basically, almost all the cellars are really uh, defunct, almost vacant spaces at this point, uh, just really utilized for uh, mechanical and things of that nature. So the residents no longer go down there. I don't think they've gone down there in 50 plus years, um, and those murals were removed 
Um, we, we did see some photos of like plaster cracking and things like that, but there are no indications of murals in the buildings uh, anymore. Um, they're in, okay. they were removed, they're in the Brooklyn Museum, and there's a replica actually in the uh, second floor of the um, community building, uh, just across the street from the project. I happened to, wandering through there, and unfortunately it's in the back corner, but I, I happened to spot it there. But other than that, um, we've lost that history uh, of this project. So we think it's a very important piece of history. Obviously it's in the museum, but I think the residents need to be made aware of it and have the ability to enjoy it on a daily basis. Agree. Second, um, the new art, the new installation that you're placing in a landscape, how many are you placing? The, the, um, the sculptures themselves, uh, at this point, we're thinking maybe half a dozen or so th throughout the site. The murals themselves, we've indicated about a dozen locations of walls that they can be um, uh, installed on plus the basketball court, plus the um, uh, trash enclosure uh, walls. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron, please go next. Thanks, my questions are related to the same um, area having to do with the murals. So there was n not in the original plan, the Lascaux plan, a, a kind of a, um, a any indication of a murals being on the exterior on these retaining walls. Um, that's part one and two. So are the new murals, the, their design going to be based on those ones that are currently in the museum? Or is there any kind of a, a framework to give artists about these murals? So, so part, part A of the question, correct. There, the, the artwork was originally limited to, to those cellar locations. Uh, not, nothing on the outside, nothing on the, uh, on the grounds per se. Um, so part, part B, we're still working out the details. Um, it, I, we don't know as far as selecting the artists, making sure we have local artists, making sure the tenants and, and the residents have a, a committee that they can work with local artists We'd like to give them the direction um, and pay homage uh, to this artwork. I don't know if we can designate certain areas where we would like to say, okay, these you know, six should be replicas of the, of the original artwork and the others are more open to interpretation. That's something we still need to work out the exact details on while we work with the residents uh, and, and artists as well. Um, it, it, I, I hate to tell an artist like this is what you have to do, but I also strongly believe we, we need to pay homage to that and would like to designate some areas specific to that. And, and okay. I do think we have enough opportunities, uh, areas where we might be able to accommodate both. All right, other questions? All right, not now, not seeing any questions. Um, so we'll move to public testimony and I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Fabre to walk us through the speakers. If you're here in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And um, we'll start with anyone who signed up in advance and then get to others. Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have a few signups. The first person that I will bring in is Trina McKeever. Trina, you should be in the meeting and you just have to unmute your microphone and turn on your camera if you wish to. Trina, you are muted. Looks like she's connecting to audio. Yeah, it's taking her a little while to connect. Should I um, bring in the next person until her connection issue is solved or looks like it's still- What? Oh. Yeah, what? 
Trina, can you speak so we can see? Okay, it's still showing it's loading. I'll bring in the next person and uh, hopefully be she'll be able to connect. So I'll bring in Kelly Carroll next. Okay, Kelly should be in the meeting. Looks like Trina. There we go. There's a little bit of a lag. Okay. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. As with the prior application for window replacement at the Williamsburg houses, HDC finds this application commendable. The proposed amenities, uh, am amenities are in the spirit of urban improvements, which characterize the genesis of the houses and the depression era. Details such as the replication of original light fixtures and reinterpretation of federal art project murals is laudable. Despite the large scope of work, the proposed modifications are a light touch to this interwar complex and do not detract from its collective aesthetic in an unreversible way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trina. I think you are ready to go now. Trina, are you there? I think she unfortunately is having issues. Uh, Rich, could we move her back into the attendees and I'll bring her in after, maybe sure. like bring her back in, we'll fix the issue. Yeah. So I'll, I'll bring in Mark Bench and then I'll try Trina again. Anthony, good morning and thank you. May I be heard? Yes, you're good to go. Excellent, thank you. Good morning, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. This is Mark Bench for on behalf of the Victorian Society in New York. Founded in New York City in 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering the appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individual landmarks, interiors, and civic art. The Victorian Society of New York is pleased to see a proposal focusing on the landscape of the Williamsburg houses. Successful tower in the park designs put as much design effort into the park as the towers, perhaps more. Yet the landscapes of these projects have often been neglected in the initial design and then in the lack of maintenance and in expedient alterations that follow. Although we have been unable to determine whether there was a landscape architect associated with Williamsburg design, its historic form, much of which remains, was crucial to its success. This proposal will, will not only, sorry, this proposal will benefit not only this important individual landmark, but the hundreds of our fellow New Yorkers who call it home. We do have some questions and suggestions. The large central spaces on three of the blocks once open green swords have been cluttered with a great deal of stuff, including ball courts, playgrounds, miscellaneous furnishings, and lots of pavement. This proposal does not move towards restoration of the original character of these spaces. In fact, more hardscape is proposed. We would like to see an attempt made to restore the character of these central spaces. The architectural and landscape features of the entrances to the buildings were carefully designed, apparently variations on a theme. The presentation of materials provided are insufficient to fully understand the original designs of the entrance ensemble. We suggest that these be looked at carefully with the goal of fully restoring the landscape component. The proposed light pole fixtures look fine, provided the height is correct. Are they the same human scale as the originals? How does the plan compare with the historic lighting layout? And can the lighting scheme allow for the removal of the awful highway style brackets attached to the buildings? Finally, we note that the original design had hedge borders to help control the use of the lawns. The proposed nearly fenceless design leads us to wonder how the lawns and plantings will be maintained. Is there a workable and funded plan for maintenance? Nothing would be worse than to have the lovely new plantings degraded and for expedient solutions, that is fencing to reappear. As an aside, since the commission hasn't yet taken an action on the previous public meeting item 14 to 16 Fifth Avenue, 
we note that the designation report for the Williamsburg Houses states that there is nothing, not a brick, not a window, not a service, anywhere on this complex that is original or even old. It's all reconstructed and yet it is very much a landmark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Trina, I'm going to see if I could just um, allow you to, to speak uh, rather than bringing you directly in. See if that works. So I've asked you to unmute. Can you hear us? Okay, I th think, um, should I try and bring her in one last time or should we just read the board's resolution? Why don't we um, just try one last time and if that doesn't work, then we'll, we can read it in because she would have read it, read it in and because of technical difficulties, um, there are, she doesn't have that opportunity. Okay, let's try. Okay, so it's showing that she's connecting. I think it's lagging a bit. Trina, it's showing that you should be able to speak. I, I don't think it's working. So uh, Rich, um, I guess it, maybe you should read the board's resolution. Sure, should I read everything or how, how do we wanna? Yeah, I think to the extent that she's present and she would have read the whole thing, we should, and since we have it already, we should do that. Okay, give me one second. This is the committee report from Brooklyn Community Board One. Um, the site plan presentation is the second final LPC approval needed from CB1 for the overall renovation of the Williamsburg houses. The architects previously presented new windows in January 2021. Matthew Rooney from RDC Development briefly explained the scope of the overall project, reintroducing the comprehensive plan to renovate the interior and exterior of the Williamsburg houses under the rental assistance demonstration program, converting the NYCHA project from section nine uh, to section eight. Frank Lang spoke about St. Nick's role for the project as social service provider, which will include workforce development, direct counseling, hosting programming, and other services for residents. Project architect Brian Newman presented the landscaping plan, uh, the aim of which is to preserve the historic content while instilling, quote, real betterment by rehabilitating planting beds and hedges, removing fencing to soften the edges of pocket parks while adding updated play equipment, period correct site furnishings, and energy efficient lighting, security cameras, bike racks, enclosing the garbage collecting, and instituting a public art program for walls and spaces in homage to the original abstract murals, some now in the Brooklyn Museum, that were commissioned for the opening of the Williamsburg Houses. Overall, the committee found the plan presented a thoughtful and appropriate improvement. Committee asked if the paths would remain asphalt or whether the original cement and Belgian block would be restored. The asphalt will remain. It was pointed out that the choice of replacement bench was not period appropriate. Acknowledging the lack of mature shade trees throughout CB1, that the presentation call for removing trees was questioned. Also, the reality of a potential graffiti problem was brought up with regards to the murals. A suggestion was made to directly involve tenants in the tree removal decisions, as well as the selection of artists slash artworks in hopes of tenant involvement slash ownership um, in the process would lessen potential graffiti. Rain gardens for stormwater drainage and, and a composting program were suggested as well. Uh, the recommendation, uh, the committee voted unanimously to recommend that the board vote the site plan presentation for the Williamsburg houses appropriate with the following suggestions. Replace proposed benches with more period appropriate benches, avoid removing mature trade trees, prune the trees where needed, uh, obtain community member consensus as far as any removal deemed necessary, and involve community members in curating decisions with regards to public art. All right, thank you. And then, um, Rich, do you also have any other written 
comments that we've received? That you no can other additional record? written comments. Okay, great, thank you. So let me turn back to Mr. Newman. Would you like to respond to the comments we've heard both from the community board and others? Yes, uh, just specific to the community board. Um, we agreed with their uh, response on the bench uh, and that has subsequently been updated. And that was what I presented today. It was a, an updated style uh, on the site furnishing uh, slide as far as the bench. Uh, as far as the trees, uh, the concern, uh, just to give a little backstory, a lot of these trees are the original 1938 trees, which have never or very, very rarely been pruned. They have grown on top of the buildings are resting on the buildings, creating some of the water leak issues and problems uh, with the roofing systems and masonry in the past. Uh, we will be bringing in an arborist to clearly direct and, and assess the situation, what trees should be pruned, appropriate, appropriately be pruned. If necessary, removed, we're going to try to steer away from removing mature trees, but we will default to the arborist and then present it back to the tenants so that, or the residents so they understand um, what exactly we're doing before we do anything. Um, I had mentioned uh, working with the residents as far as the art program and the artists and local, local artists. So we, we are totally on board working directly with them and trying to come up with a, a workable program on how to manage that and direct that. Um, as far as uh, a previous comment regarding lighting scale, um, as I mentioned, we were replacing all light fixtures in kind. We will check the heights of the poles though. Uh, I just, I don't have that information handy at the time. We were very focused on the luminaire. It was very difficult to, to locate something that came very close to matching. Um, as far as the center spaces, the, the center court, uh, generally speaking, they were wide open grass areas uh, as that original design. Over time though, the amenities for the residents have taken, uh, ha have taken place in there, whether it's the basketball court or some of the playgrounds for those children. Um, I'm hesitant to remove that type of amenity from the residents who live there to get it period correct but take away from the residents. So the trade-off in our mind, uh, while we're going to be upgrading all those areas, was to remove all that fencing and then create those pocket parks and those other green areas um, that were part of the original design, but the tenants uh, have not been able to utilize because they've been fenced off and they've been uh, unmanicured and, and really just let let go. So that's sort of the trade-off what we're were uh, looking to do there. But I, I too totally understand and respect that comment as far as the original intent, just afraid to take away from the residents that are there today. Right. Okay, thank you. Sir, I, I'm sorry, I just yeah. want to note that the community board did request that I just clarify that this is the committee report that the full board has not yet voted on this yet. And I believe it's being voted on tomorrow. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions, commissioners? Okay, I'm gonna start uh, requesting to unmute all of you so that we can close the hearing and move to our discussion. So Commissioner Beland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, again, another very interesting presentation for a very interesting um, individual landmark. So this proposal is addressing the hardscaping and landscaping. And um, I think in some aspects, trying to look back to the original intent while making adjustments that also meet current needs. And so the proposal includes removing a fencing, um, and installing some limited new fencing, configure, reconfiguring the landscapes, um, and then the installation of furniture, such as benches, bike racks, garbage enclosure, flagpole, and light poles. And then um, the presence and the location of new murals and sculptures. So um, several aspects to this sort of overall approach to the design. If we can try to hit on them in our comments that all of them, or most of them in the comments, that would be great. 
So, um, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, well, I think this is a is you know very commendable um, proposal to open up the landscape to the uh, to the tenants of these houses. Um, I think the removal of the fencing is a very positive move, um, and reintroducing the shrubbery to sort of you know in, in place of the of the fencing is 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 a much better design solution. Um, and I think I understand the the um, applicant's desire to keep the amenities for the tenants, um, which sort of precludes those open areas from being put back as lawn. So I think I think that's appropriate um, for their modern use. Um, I think the introduction of <clears throat> excuse me of the murals is is fantastic. Um, if they can bring back replicas of the original and it get really good local input from artists to make that a really rich program. I think that would just really help enliven those blank, blank walls. But I think overall, this is really excellent application and I can support it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Chapin. <clears throat> Uh, just a moment, uh, just a moment, Sarah, I'll be right back. Sure, of course. Commissioner Goldblum. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with Anne. This is, uh, you guys are doing God's work. This is a great project. It's incredibly exciting. <laughs> it is an amazing landmark and an important landmark, and you guys are you know, on top of the work that you did already with the windows, this is exciting, fantastic, wonderful, wonderful, important, important work. Um, I think that pretty much everything that was presented was appropriate. I would suggest that you continue to try to uh, strike the right balance with those center green spaces. I think that uh, the integration of program into them is appropriate and necessary and that they cannot be returned to, to unified lawns. However, to the extent that you can uh, unify them by the landscaping, by the colors, by the um, uh, just the detailing of the, of the edges and the spaces and the surfaces, the more you can um, <coughs> unify them as uh, single aesthetic spaces, while preserving the program, I think that that would over, overrule the, uh, for instance, in this image, the, the decision to, to uh, use the mural as the base for the court painting. Um, I, I think that uni unity and, and the kind of visual calm that was intended by a large center lawn should be your goal to the extent that you can make that jive with the program variations that are there and that need to remain there. I think that the um, resident focus of everything you said is spot on, wonderful, great, amazing, should be an, a, an example and a requirement for every development in New York City. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, the, I don't think you feel you should, I think that your, your view about the murals is 1000% correct in terms of suggesting and inspiring, but not requiring the replication. Um, I think the locations chosen were, uh, were wonderful and appropriate. I think you should be very careful though, and you can work with staff on the method of, of application and protection of those uh, murals, because while they might look great on year one, you don't want them to look like hell by year three. So um, do, do whatever research is necessary to make sure that the materials used are long lasting and that they'll look as good in 50 years as they look today. Uh, I think the benches and lights were, were well chosen. I think the removal of the fencing is imperative and, and very, very thoughtful. I have nothing, nothing but wonderful things to say about this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. 
Yeah, I, I agree with Michael. I, this, this is an extraordinarily thoughtful design, inclusive design. Um, I, I agree somewhat with the, the issue of the materials for uh, the murals, but the city is gonna have to understand that once this work is done, maintenance is going to be key. It, the design can go anywhere at once, but if you don't maintain it, um, everything is out the window. But this is an extraordinary design and, and just perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I echo uh, everyone's comment, including Carrie Carroll's uh, uh, testimony. This is wonderfully designed and uh, Commissioner Devonshire's uh, comment about maintenance uh, uh, is absolutely spot on. Uh, I, I, uh, I commend, especially love the murals, uh, the, the restoration. Uh, the one comment I have about is the sanitation trash uh, backup area. Um, uh, see if you can do something about, because to me that looks like, uh, it's almost like privatized into a whole trash bin area. And I wonder if there's any improvement that can be done to it. I understand there's a very reasonable request from the Department of Sanitation uh, for safety reasons. You didn't want to back up sanitation area. The whole thing sort of becomes a, a separate zone. So I wonder if there's anything that can be done to either enhance it or, or buffer it or somehow. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bland? Not sure how many more uh, uh, over the top kind of words we can find to describe, but uh, maybe I haven't found one that is better than the ones that have been used so far, which I certainly support. Um, yeah, this is such a laudable and a model, I think, for other um, housing projects uh, in New York City. Um, I don't really have more to add to what's already been said. So in the interest of time, I think I'll just say this is a wonderful thing. I will also, though, add from my perspective of garden design uh, that uh, nothing deteriorates faster than the landscape. And so maintenance will be key. And perhaps uh, uh, there's a local um, volunteer group that can be trained to help maintain it, uh, to maintain their own spaces. Thank you. This is a great project. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, I'm just going to add a few. Uh, extra points here. I agree, it's fantastic and obviously long overdue project to upgrade the landscape, the hardscape and the playscape of, of this uh, landmark housing development. Um, I'm, I, I think this the concept of community engagement is, is one that makes this incredibly successful. And, you know, I think- <laughs> so many projects throughout the city it doesn't always happen so i applaud the applicant for that as others have done i i the landscaping is terrific i'm especially pleased that the uh tenants are going to get community garden here um and i am fine with the fixtures and the furniture. i i i do the removal of the fences is great but i do um, I want to say one thing about the murals. I love the concept. I like this idea of having a half and half, you know, some that replicate, some that are, are inspired by bringing in uh, local artists to help. But I'm not so sure that the murals should be, there should be any murals in the trash area or um, on the municipal court, especially when you think about uh, maintenance issues. Uh, I'm sorry, could you just repeat that? You said not on the trash and, and then I couldn't hear you. Basketball court. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, amazing project, but what I find even more amazing is the amount of effort you guys put in for community participation that the tenants can play a role in decision-making. I, I really think that's an amazing part of it and just extraordinary job. Okay, great. Commissioner Gustafson. Yep, I, I have nothing to add. It's it, this is terrific. Okay. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I agree with 
all of comments about how positive and um, thought well thought through the whole project is and, and it's, it's it's really it's really kind of as beautiful as the original you know another level of beautiful as the original um, design was I think I do still have a little bit of um, of a struggle with the murals <coughs> the question is in my mind sort of why were where there are never murals planned for the existing outdoor area. And if there were never murals planned, then is it entirely appropriate to, to insert those or to cover those retaining walls or panels with, with, with murals or images of any kind? And then does it, is it actually, what, what does it mean to actually make these be, um, rep, to, to replicate the original um, federal arts program murals. I, I'm not entirely convinced of that either, nor am I so convinced about um, sort of new murals, even though I imagine that the original design would have loved the idea. I mean, maybe they didn't have it because there was not enough of a budget. I mean, I, I don't really understand. So I'm having a little bit of a difficult time for it. My only kind of slight solution on it is to actually go the opposite way from um, Commissioner Goldblum and Devonshire around this issue of permanence and maintenance of these murals. I mean, maybe the idea is actually for them to be um, ever changing, meaning that what you, the, the, the given is that these were once, you know, white painted or unfinished walls and that that's their kind of their forever nature and that, that maybe they get um, painted and can be painted over again. And, and that reflects a kind of continuity of community participation, maybe they're not painted, maybe they're applied in other ways. But there's something about identifying the fact that these didn't have images on them, that the images were in the community rooms, in the basement or wherever, and not here. As much as I think it's a beautiful, positive thing, I'm just trying to think about the appropriateness of this, of the kind of the preservation. Mm -hmm. thing. So thank you. Right. So yeah, Mr. Newman, I'm afraid we've closed the hearing. So um, uh, uh, I know you want to respond, yes. Diana, I know I'm coming back to you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think it's a great project and I wanna echo the remarks of other commissioners uh, supporting it. I particularly wanna applaud the spirit of the overall approach, which reflects the original intention of this project, which is by increasing the benefit uh, of the common areas with amenities that residents have input to and uh, also the improve improvements uh, which have been fit in in the existing hardscaping without making large changes. And really, and I think utilizing uh, local artists uh, is also a good thing to do. And to me, uh, public art is a tradition in New York City. And I think we don't normally get into the details of exactly, uh, you know, in, in public spaces, what kind of art is going to be placed there. Mm -hmm. So I think that the murals and the uh, uh, sculptural pieces which are envisioned uh, are really can uh, be totally appropriate. So I, I think uh, all of the details really are, are very appropriate to this and it's a terrific project. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, and thank you for those comments and speaking more about the idea of the art and um, and I and I, I like you know your thought that public art is a tradition in New York and maybe for Commissioner Shamir Barron one as you were sort of thinking about it and thinking about the kind of reversibility of the painting or the sculpture sitting in the in, I think you're really just talking about the painting so um, but that reversibility may be a way to allow you to think about those concrete walls otherwise not being changed in those spaces. So I do think we have support for it as is. Um, I think there are a couple of ideas of things that could be continue to be explored, but um, as far as the motion goes, I think we're prepared to approve it as is. And so Commissioner Holford, if you would go ahead and make that motion, that would be great. Sure. Uh, in the matter of LPC 2104770, 160 uh, Mauser Street, <clears throat> Williamsburg houses an individual landmark. 
an international style housing project designed by William Muscat and Richmond H. Shreve and built in 1935-1938. The application is to modify landscape ele elements, install murals, enclosures, and miscellaneous fixtures. I recommend approval, finding that the removal of non-historic fixtures, paving, and miscellaneous elements will eliminate unsympathetic alterations that detract from the complex without removing any historic fabric. That the restoration of historic paving and landscaping will return these elements to a condition more in keeping with their original appearance. That the proposed furnishings, including benches, tables, bike racks, and trash cans, are typical of such installations found at parks and public spaces throughout the city and will not detract from this individual landmark. That the proposed areas of new fencing surrounding amenity areas will be low scale and shielded by plantings and will not eliminate the open character of the interior green spaces. That the installation of urban gardens featuring low scale terraced planting beds will be easily reversible and will not result in damage to or loss of any significant historic fabric. That the proposed murals and public art will be modestly scaled and reflect the cultural history of commissioned abstract public artworks at the Williamsburg houses from the 1930s. That the proposed mur murals will be located at areas of plain concrete at existing non-historic retaining walls and at sports courts and therefore will not obscure or damage any significant historic fabric of the designated building. That the proposed blue rubber play surfaces within the playground spaces and dog run will be limited in footprint and recall the historic blue metal panels found at the storefronts within the complex that the proposed new flagpole will replace an existing flagpole at this location and the cobble paving surrounding the flagpole will recall, will recall the cobbles historically found within the tree pits throughout this complex. That the proposed light poles will match the overall profile of the light poles seen in historic photographs and that the elimination of the glass lantern will allow the fixtures to meet dark sky requirements. That the new and expanded garbage enclosures will be located at existing paved areas facing secondary facades and will not detract from the interior green space of the complex and that the work will enhance the special architectural and historic character of this individual landmark. Thank you. And Commissioner um, Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Oops. Thank you. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 11 in favor and unopposed, the motion carries. Okay, thank you. So that's approved as is. Um, and while we did have the support to approve it, there were a couple of uh, commissioners who commented on sort of how you could continue to think about treating that central space, um, that central green space. So um, if you continue to think about that and, and work with the staff, um, that would be great. We'd welcome that as well. Absolutely. But otherwise approved as is. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for your feedback and your comments. We'll certainly refine it. Uh, as we move forward and, and take that into consideration. Appreciate everyone's time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll now move to the next item. Okay, the next item is hearing item number two, LPC 21-06027, application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, lot 196, lot 15, 208 Dean Street in the Borough Hill Historic mm -hmm. District. This is an Italianate style row house built in 1852 to 53. And the application is to construct a rear yard addition. Um, the applicant has joined the hearing. You now have control of the presentation. You may begin. Uh, hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Hi, Carol. Um, hi, uh, my name is Justin. Uh, I am from BW Architects here in New York. Uh, I am uh, excited to work on this project. I actually lived uh, in this historic district for 18 years uh, until I recently moved. Um, I've known the owners who, who own the townhouse and have lived in the area for about the same amount of time. Uh, they are now proposing a uh, an in addition to the house that they've lived in, uh, continue it to be uh, the, the two family configuration uh, for themselves and their uh, two adult children now. 
the house is located in the original Gorham Hill Historic District. Um, and you will see as, as I advance through the slides here, uh, that the southern portion on this plan right now is part of the uh, 2018 extended Borum Hill Historic District, um, where you see that that cluster of additions, which I'll have some photos of in a minute, uh, were all uh, submitted and approved uh, prior to being part of LPC uh, in general. That's my slide here. Uh, there are no proposed changes to the facade uh, at the front of the building. Uh, it was actually restored 13 years ago when the townhouse was converted from an SRO uh, by a different company. Uh, so there's there's nothing proposed in the front uh, with the sole exception of some plantings, which is required as per zoning. So what is currently all hardscape will actually be uh, retrofit into a uh, an all planted garden uh, as required by zoning. The rear of the building, uh, we are proposing uh, two-story addition uh, that would be the entire width of the lot. Uh, we, however, are not going out the full zoning permissibility. Uh, we're only extending out 12 feet uh, into the rear yard. Uh, that's all we need programmatically uh, for the bottom two floors. Uh, there was a mock-up done for confirming line of sight, which was done with this uh, orange flag, uh, because over on Dean Street, there is a, uh, I'm sorry, on Bond Street, there was a sliver of a view corridor uh, available. And uh, in performing the mock-up, we actually uh, found to the, to the best of our ability that this would not be visible uh, in between the carriage house that exists on Bond Street and the corner property. Uh, there's an existing uh, fence that obscures uh, the view. Uh, going into the donut, uh, we have a, a mix. Uh, immediately in the backyard, there is a, uh, there's a large uh, four-story addition uh, going to the, the maximum permissible height in R6B. Uh, that was at, at 203 Bergen, it's, it's an EFIS facade. Uh, 209 Bergen has a, uh, a vinyl siding uh, and then further down the block uh, all the way over at 225 Bergen, uh, there's an assortment of other uh, additions that exist. Uh, this is our floor plan, it's, it's a modest two family. Uh, the, Existing deck is looking to be relocated and reused again uh, into the rear yard. The um, 12 foot uh, addition is on the bottom two floors. And then there is a small room which will actually have an indoor uh, shower uh, off of the master suite on the second floor uh, for the owners. Uh, this is the, the line of sight from Dean Street which remains unchanged. Uh, and then this is the addition at the back. And advancing one more slide. Uh, this is the uh, new proposed area of construction. Uh, down here on the uh, left is our rendering. I don't know if I could zoom in on this. I don't seem to be able to zoom in on that. I'm sorry, let me go back one. How do I go back a slide here? Does anyone know? You just use a, uh, arrow keys. I'm getting no love. I'm getting no love for my arrow keys here. Right here, I'll just move it for you. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, so it's an all brick addition uh, and we have a, a slight setback uh, in order to modulate the facade a bit. Uh, at the uh, recommendation of my, of my pre, uh, previous meeting with LPC, we have done, um, changed the side lots of the addition from stucco to brick uh, to match as well uh, so that it would be the same pattern on the sides uh, as it would be on the south facing elevation. Uh, the other feedback we had gotten previously from LPC was I had external leaders uh, on the facade and we were requested to internalize them. Uh, so that was not, not objectionable to anybody. So we've folded those back onto the inside. Um, we've already been through land use at CB2 in Brooklyn. We received unanimous support uh, for 12 to zero. Um, and we had full engagement with the neighbors. One of the neighbors actually is a contractor who's bidding on the job as well. Uh, so it is, uh, it's, it's something that th it was very important to the owners in particular who are members, active members of the community to not feel like they were um, uh, doing anything egregious uh, to their property. Uh, and they are planning to continue to live here uh, well after the job is complete. Um, so it's meant to be a, an expanded version of their home. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions, commissioners? 
Okay, no questions at this time. Let's move to public testimony. Um, if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Anthony Fabre to take us through the testimony. Thank you. We do have signups for this item. The first person that I will bring in is Kelly Carroll. Kelly should be in the meeting. Thank you. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. HDC found the thick masonry piers that extend from the ground to the second floor to be alien to the block and visually constitute a massive addition to the simple Italianate row house. Their appearance would be less severe if they did not continue past the floor level and instead a simple railing was installed at the second floor balcony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is the only sign up for this item and I do not see any other hands raised. Okay, thank you. And Rich, did we have any written testimony? Just the community board resolution, which as the applicant already noted was unanimously approved. Okay, thank you. All right, um, would you like to respond to the testimony about the uh, design and the parapet wall? Um, I, um, I actually, I don't, uh, it was, it was, we actually discussed this with the owners. It was primarily for, for privacy and for sort of visual noise for the area. Um, it, it is, um, it, it's a little bit more common in the backyard on the single story ones where they do have the rails. You see everybody's clutter and their outdoor peripherals and dilapidated cushions. And, and the intent was to actually, to bring that up to the required height was meant to actually provide a, a, a more appealing visual consistency from an architectural standpoint. Uh, that, that was the intent. Um, and the modulation of the facade was meant to, to break down the mass a little bit. So it wasn't a 22 foot wide unarticulated brick elevation. Uh, so that, that was the intent. Okay, thank you. Any final questions, commissioners? Okay, I think we will move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. Okay, and Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. So um, uh, this is a, a two-story rear yard addition within a block um, with other additions of two stories and in some cases uh, taller. And um, the work is not visible from a public thoroughfare and um, the addition is clad in brick um, with a fenestration pattern that is um, in keeping with the kinds of rear yard additions we see. So Commissioner Devonshire, do you wanna start on this one? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. I think this is uh, totally appropriate. The, the, the piers are a little bit massive, but the explanation given um, makes sense to me. So I can approve it as presented. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. Yes, I agree with Commissioner Devonshire. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Agreed. This is typical of things that we approve um, quite often. Uh, and I also accept the explanation of the of the peers going up, and um, I think it's fine as presented. Okay, Commissioner Lupfi. Um, I think it's a, a good project. However, I do think the peers are heavy looking, and I, I personally would recommend having the fence going across. I, I would I would also just make this a flat. Uh, brick surface. I think it will be a lot, a lot cleaner looking because there's a lot going on here, um, and that's it. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I I can approve this. It's very odd to have the piers seem to stop on the second floor on the, not go all the way down to the ground floor, but I can approve it. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson. Appropriate as is. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Sorry, appropriate as presented. <laughs> okay. 
and Commissioner Holford Smith. I think it's appropriate. I had a similar um, reaction to the peers, but I think after hearing the explanation, I'm okay with it. Okay, uh, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I agree, I can approve it as presented. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Agreed. Okay, thanks. And I think Commissioner Devonshire, you wanted to add something? No, I'm good. Oh, okay, I thought I saw your hand raised. Okay, all right, so I think we have um, enough commissioners in support of it as is, so we'll go ahead and make that motion. Commissioner Devonshire, would you read that? Sure. Sorry. In the matter of 208 Dean Street, Perfect <coughs> District, an Italian A style row house built in 1852 53, an application to construct a rear yard addition. I recommend approval, finding that the work will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features. The proposed rear yard addition will be only partially visible from a very limited viewpoint through a break in the street wall on Bond Street. The depth of the rear yard addition will be in keeping with other additions of a similar footprint within the block. Therefore, the addition will not diminish the block's central green space. The two-story height of the addition is in keeping with others in the block, and the third-story bump out is limited to one bay and will not overwhelm the scale of the building or others in the row. And the brick-clad rear addition and stucco bump out will feature a materials palette and ratio of solid to void that is consistent with other rear additions found throughout the block. All right, and Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second it. Thank you, and Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lecfee? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 11 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, that's approved. Thank you. We'll Wonderful. move to the next item. Thanks very much, everyone. The next item is number three, LPC 21 06414, an application for an advisory report. This is in the borough of Brooklyn, Block 28. 2088, Lot 1, Fort Greene Park in the Fort Greene Historic District. 19th Century Park, built in 1840 and altered in 1866 to 1873 by Olmsted and Vox, and in 1906 to 09 by McKim, Mead, and White. The application is to install a boulder and replace a plaque. Commissioners, the applicants are here to present this, and we now have control of presentation. Great, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm Jennifer Lancis, and I am the Deputy Director of Art and Antiquities at Parks, and we're here today to present the recreation and relocation of the Spanish Memorial Plaque in Fort Greene Park, Brooklyn. So to give you a sense of where we are um, discussing, this zooms into the Prison Ship Martyrs Monument Plaza in Fort Greene Park, Brooklyn. The original Spanish memorial plaque was located on the western side of the plaza um, and the new plaque that we will be discussing, we are proposing it for the eastern side on the pathway between the, um, the visitor center, which you can see in the upper right, and the prison ship martyrs monument. So this uh, is the Spanish memorial plaque. Um, it is an oversized plaque in plinth given to the city of New York by Spain in 1976 in celebration of the bicentennial of the American Revolution. The plaque honors the 126 Spanish prisoners that were held on the British prison ships uh, out in the East River during the conflict. It was placed here to be proximate to the prison ship martyrs monument, which honors all, I think it was about 11,500 prisoners that were on those ships. King Juan Carlos, the first of Spain, dedicated this plaque on June 5th in 1976. In the rush to accommodate um, the royal visit, it wasn't reviewed by Parks or the Art Commission, which is typically required of all monuments. Um, in the rush to also accommodate this visit, um, it appears that there were some flaws in the design. Um, and we think that if we had the opportunity to comment on it, um, 
it, it might have sustained some design changes. Um, ultimately, the Art Commission didn't approve this until after the piece was already in place. Um, so to, I can, I'm going to summarize very briefly some of the design flaws, but I can go into greater detail later. One, this is an oversized plaque that um, is something that we would never recommend because of their tendency to warp, or in this case, it almost fractured in half. Um, it's also skyward facing, which means it's extremely prone to weathering and vandalism. And um, in the rush to create this, there were a number of spelling and grammatical errors. For example, Brooklyn was spelled with a I instead of a Y. So um, in the 1990s, the plaque ultimately sustained such vandalism and damage that Parks removed the bronze um, from the center of the base. This is a photo of the existing base to give you some context of its typical condition. Um, as well as where it's located within the plaza. Um, the plaque was moved to storage, but in 2015, we moved it to the visitor center where it is displayed in the vestibule as you enter the park um, visitor center. So this is the original plaque. You can see on the right, uh, the condition in the visitor center. And this shows you exactly where it's located as you enter the, the front doorway of the visitor center where they exhibit um, information about the park history, the neighborhood history, individuals who are visiting have to pass this plaque. Um, so um, we are now um, with the support of the Queen Sophia Spanish Institute, the Fort Greene Park Conservancy and Iberdrola. Um, we are interested in recreating the plaque, removing the base and relocating the piece to a more visible location. Um, the design that we are proposing, we're essentially taking this opportunity to address the myriad of issues with the original design um, and propose a more appropriate design in line with historic landscape and monument markers throughout the park system. Um, we're proposing a plaque measuring 20 by 25 inches on a boulder that measures around two feet high by five feet wide. Um, we are suggesting that it's placed in this pathway on the eastern side. Um, of the plaza between the visitor center and the plaza. This um, area is one of the most heavily trafficked areas um, in this space. Uh, in the current location where the um, base is located, it's kind of off the beaten path. We don't get a lot of visitors over there. And unfortunately, a lot of the activity that does happen or does occur there is not activity we would like to see all the time in our parks. Um, so it kind of puts, uh, it would put the monu monument at threat um, here we go. These are a couple of other renderings um, to give you an idea of how this would look. It would currently be placed next to an existing planting bed, which we are suggesting will be extended to go in front of and around this, this plaque and boulder that would uh, not only bring attention to the piece, but also provide a certain level of protection in terms of climbing, um, you know, dogs, etc. Um, we also feel like this design is more in keeping with the historic nature of the park. Um, so uh, throughout the park, especially around the um, Prison Ship Martyrs, Martyrs Monument Plaza, there are a number of these kind of uh, erratic errant boulders. Um, and so we feel that this design with the plaque on the boulder, it will kind of more blend seamlessly into essentially the historic park. Um, we're hoping that should we receive approvals, we would aim to install this in, within like the next year, year and a half, depending on any delays with uh, contractors in terms of uh, COVID regulations, et cetera. Um, so I think that's it and I'm, I'm welcome to, to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I think we don't have any questions at this time, so we will move to public Commissioner testimony. Jefferson, I think, has a question. Gosh, why am I not seeing the hands? Okay, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Yeah, the, the monument itself, what's the relationship between the, the, the monument and, and, the, and, and the plaque? Are they support, do they have a direct relationship? So I'm standing there, I read the monument, read the plaque and I look at the monument or is it detached? 
So the monument itself, the Prison Ship Martyrs Monument, um, existed well before this plaque. The monument, um, the, the larger one, uh, honors the, and it actually acts as an active crypt for the 11,500 men and women who were prisoners on British ships in the East River during the American Revolution. Then in 1976, um, as a celebration of the Bicentennial, a number of dignitaries and royals from around the world came to America to help celebrate our, our uh, anniversary. And so essentially the, um, the Spanish king, king came here to, as a way of honoring um, Spain's influence in the Bicentennial, the, uh, the American Revolution. This specific plaque honors the 126 prisoners of the 11,000 that were Spanish um, that were on those ships. So there is a I, tendential. I, I, I understand that. So why was it placed where it was placed originally? It was placed in relationship to the monument, just aesthetic, just formal. Oh, um, um, to be honest, uh, it, in our research, there doesn't seem to have been much thought in regard to the design of the monument or the plaque. I think it was somewhat out of convenience. It appears to be that it was an extremely rushed job. Um, it's a lot, rather spacious area on the western side of, of the, uh, the monument. So it, it is our best guess, at least based on kind of uh, the, the flaws in fabrication and the design, etc., that this just was a place of convenience um, because it was within the, 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 light, the, the sight lines of the Prison Ship Martyrs Monument. Okay, the second question, the, the, the boulder, is it mm -hmm. attached to a footing or does the boulder can be moved in 10 years or 15 years? Is the boulder anchored in a way that it cannot be moved or can it be moved? So the boulder itself will be, we won't anchor the boulder. It'll be of such a extreme weight that, you know, you would have to hire a contractor essentially and heavy equipment to do the moving. Um, but, but members of the public who are in using that space, they would not be able to move it, but we don't plan on anchoring because yeah, the weight alone would, would keep it sustained. So the there. boulder is, the, the boulder can be moved in 50 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you just get the equipment to move it. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. So not seeing any other questions, we'll move to testimony and I will... Turn it over to Anthony Fabre to take us through the speakers. If you'd like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And we will start with anyone who signed up in advance. Thank you. We do we do have a few signups. The first person that I will bring in is Juan Blanco. Juan, you should be in the meeting. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay, let me get this thing. Okay, yes, let um, me introduce myself first. My name is Juan Blanco. Uh, first and foremost, I am a native Brooklynite. I am his, of Hispanic background. Uh, I'm also an architect, a preservationist, and a historian. And I'd like to say, uh, given that I concern myself with monuments in other places, that monuments are, always have a history in themselves as a mirror a reflection. And contrary to what was said, I, I see that the original location of the monument is something that is really crucial to understanding its nature. And I think that if anything, given the context in which we live, where there is so much denigration of the Hispanic component of the United States on every level, it is very important to underscore the sacrifice of these men and women in the American Revolution and how it helped to establish the United States. So if anything, I think that the, if there's going to be, the location of the monuments remain the same, and if it needs to be replaced, it should be replaced with something on the order of the Vietnam War Memorial, where one sees the names of the people who sac were sacrificed. I would say that also for the other thousand per persons that are buried there. I think that it underscores the humanity of the people that, were, that died there and their sacrifice. And I think that in these times of so much prejudice against everything Hispanic or Hispanic monuments to, to important people of the past are being pulled down left and right. For instance, the destruction of the statue of, of Fray Junipero Serra in, in Stanford, 
a university named after a person who was directly responsible for the genocide of the Indians of California is, is something which needs to stop. And by underscoring the sacrifice of these individuals at that moment in time, by remembering their names, it's something that, that a, does, does, does honor to the greater significance of what the monument is about. There are many people who have the same names, people who, who, who would uh, erase the presence of the Hispanic people in the United States that will learn a lesson about the, the place of the Hispanic people in the United States. That's pretty much my, my comment on this. I think that the monument's location should remain the same, that it should be replaced with a monument that has the names of the people that are being honored, not just a, a proclamation by the King of Spain. It's the most human thing to do. And it's, it's really what a monument is about because to do what is being proposed is virtually to, to make a monument to forgetting those people. I see that the location of it is very arbitrary, out of the way, something that could easily be missed. And I see the movement of the monument from its original location is something which erases the history rather than enhances it. Those are my comments. Thank you. Um, next up, I will bring in Kelly Carroll. Kelly should be in the meeting. Yes, I am. Thank you. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. While Fort Greene Park has changed over time by different designers, there remains a strong legible formal style within the park. The axial relationship between the Spanish Memorial's plaque and the prison ship martyrs monument should be preserved. And I would bet that there was some thought that went into that. The minds who decided to install this plaque in this formal public room in 1976 were honoring McKim, Mead and White's Bozar stylistic layer of the park. It is unclear why this memorial cannot be recreated and reinstalled in this location Maintenance is no excuse. We are a world-class city. If we cannot preserve our memorials, then what are we memorializing? The original granite base of the plaque is extant and appears to be in fine condition, which is not surprising considering granite's outstanding performance and as such, the stone of choice for sites of memory. The memorial's relocation to a boulder feels like a relegation. While wayfinding signs may be appropriate on boulders, this memorial was deliberately cited in its own space with a relationship to the larger monument. Something, it is something that is encountered rather than passed by. The text of the original dedication is also altered and condensed into 2021 prose, which results in a loss of the intent, feeling and authenticity of the language of the dedication, even if that dedication was rushed, still part of its history. Has the Spanish royal family or government been consulted regarding the proposed relocation and rewording of their proclamation? New York City will always be an international destination. There should be no surprises such as missing foreign dedications within our sacred urban landscapes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, I will bring in John Graham. John, uh, you should be in the meeting now. Good afternoon, commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society. Despite the modest intervention of McKim, Mead and White, Fort Green Park remains one of New York's brilliant landscapes by Olmsted and Box. It is the view of the Victorian Society in New York that proposals for this, as for other Olmsted and Box parks, whether designated as scenic landmarks or not, should be guided by the park's historic plan and character. The addition of new monuments and memorials should be avoided, and we don't understand why, since the 1976 Spanish Memorial Plaque has been conserved and is safely on permanent view in the visitor center, a second memorial plaque is warranted, oddly memorializing both the same event and the installation of the first memorial. Despite that reservation, the proposal is quite modest in scale and effect. Erratic boulders are a feature of many of Olmsted's romantic style parks, and the location doesn't appear to call attention to itself or disrupt the park landscape. 
We note that the presentation includes no information on the disposition of the empty base for the original tablet. We strongly urge the commission not to approve this proposal unless it is accompanied by a definitive plan and schedule for removal of the derelict base of the former monument and the restoration of the disturbed pavement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, those are all the signups we have for this item and I do not see any other hands raised. Thank you. And Rich, did we receive any other additional written testimony? Sorry, I do say that Christabel Goff kept trying to raise her hand. Um, all right, Christabel Goff, you, would you like to speak? I, I don't see her raising her hand. Yeah. But I've had. Oh, wait, there oh, it is. It oh, no, it's gone. Yeah. No, it's back. Okay. Sh Anthony, I... will you move her in? Yeah. Or Rich, either one. Sure, I'll bring her in. Christabel, I brought you into the meeting. You just have to. Okay. I think I am. Christabel. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Christabel Goff for the Society for the Architecture of the City. The original memorial plaque, having been neglected, perhaps soon to be failing of its purpose as a memorial, but a revision now seems calculated to add insult to injury, changing a previous prominent axial placement, emphasized by its formal relationship to the earlier monument. And judging from the photograph, a plaque originally lettered with some artistry. And it, it was in an ancient tradition of thought, form, and handwork, substantially lost now in our present century, installing a replacement informally on an obscure boulder seems stylistically inept, in that an earlier classical commemoration is reimagined as a romantic or naturalistic setting but with a different and apparently commonplace piece of mass-produced metalwork with a different wording installed on top of a modest rock. Perhaps a cogent reason for doing this at all will be presented, but having heard the presentation, we question that it was. Thank you very much. Okay, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Do not see any other hands raised. All right, great. Okay. And Rich, go ahead. Okay, so we received um, a, a resolution from Brooklyn CB2's Parks Committee. Um, they recommended approval, but they asked that they move uh, or choose a different location for the monument uh, due to potential animal traffic, uh, as well as it just seemed disconnected from the, the current location. Uh, we also received a letter from Preserver Brooklyn Neighborhoods in opposition. Okay, thank you. All right, so we've heard comments about both the location and the sort of type slash design of the memorial. Um, would you like to respond to those comments? Yeah, I can respond to some of those comments, um, especially since I didn't go into all the detail in terms of the, the problems with the design that essentially lead to um, and not impossible, but very complicated maintenance. Um, essentially, our concern, especially given that monuments should, should last a substantial amount of time in terms of material durability, um, this one failed within a mere 15 years. Um, the oversight, I mentioned how the oversized bronze is not something that we would ever recommend, um, especially skyward facing because of the issues with weathering. This particular one um, was poured unevenly, which caused pooling of water, which would still be a concern, um, even with a new pour, um, which actually caused erosion and, and uh, holes to form in the existing plaque. There were um, a number of spelling and grammatical errors um, that we would, was obviously uh, noted as, as not intended and attempted to be fixed very quickly. Um, so we, in terms of changing the uh, language to reflect the proper grammar and spelling, we would still recommend that because it was clear that because the 
organizers or installers almost immediately tried to mechanically fix that, which meant shaving off the letters um, and trying to add another one on um, is not something to be preserved. They, they never intended it to begin with. Um, in terms of the other problems with the base, I mean, the, the base itself is still in good condition. And what we're suggesting is that, it, or we're proposing here is that it actually just be removed um, and the, the site would be restored. Um, so that is part of our proposal in terms of getting approvals. Um, there was a large gap between the plinth and the bronze. Um, and this is probably a, an, an issue, even if we were to fix it, um, is that there is water infiltration that occurs, especially in skyward facing pieces and with stone, which can absorb and release water. Um, the freeze thaw nature of our environment caused the plaque to heave and warp and essentially it just continued to pop out of the base, um, which was you know, a safety hazard and, as well. Um, and really the biggest issue here was that it was prone to vandalism. Um, we wouldn't propose something like this because it acted regularly as a jumping off point for skateboarders um, and children essentially treated this as a trampoline um, while it was in place. So it didn't receive the amount of honor that we believe it, it should in terms of the individuals honored here. Um, it was essentially just used as a piece of play equipment which then led to even more damage. The, the plaque itself actually split in half um, also caused by the oversized nature of the bronze. Um, and so we have some severe concerns about like recreating it in situ as like in kind. Um, I agree, we are a world-class city. We would love to, to say that maintenance shouldn't be an issue, um, but we're a very, very small crew of, um, you know, a, a couple people on staff to maintain these. And I think it would, be prudent of us to consider these maintenance um, concerns, uh, you know, to move forward. We wouldn't want to replicate this exact design with these, these problems um, if it's going to fail an additional 15 years, um, especially given the heavy use of, of the park. Um, in terms of the location, we're suggesting specifically moving that from its current location on the western side to the eastern side because the, the area where it currently is doesn't actually get a whole lot of visibility or visitorship. Um, it's kind of an empty room, I guess you could say. Um, whereas the Western or the Eastern side, excuse me, um, the space between the monument and the visitor center is essentially the main entrance to the plaza site. Um, that's where thousands of people pass by that, that area on a regular basis. Um, People are always going into the visitor center. Not only does it hold exhibitions about the, the nature of the, the park and the neighborhood, which makes that kind of additional connection, um, but it's also the public bathrooms, <laughs> to be perfectly frank, that, that's gonna cause a lot of um, back and forth traffic. So we feel confident it's actually gonna get more notice and more uh, attention. Um, in its location here that we're proposing than in the location where it currently is, where people just kind of like, oops, pass by it and, um, and, and don't frequent that area as much um, as, as the area that we're suggesting. Um, and then in comment to whether we're in touch with Spain, um, we are in touch with the consulate. They have looked over the proposal and they fully support it. Um, so they have been notified and they are completely aware of, of what we're doing. And they're very excited to have the opportunity to kind of highlight the Hispanic contributions through the recreation of this um, in, a, in a manner that we can maintain and also is within keeping in terms of like the, the natural park, the historic park design. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron, did you have a question? Please repeat if I've missed it. it. So the original park plan had a monument on axis with the bigger one um, and that, mon that location was this particular commemoration or another? I'm sorry if I missed it. Uh, no, the original park design didn't have um, any plan for a monument in that location. Um, it was just added in 1976 for this visit by the, the King of Spain. Um, but there was nothing originally planned for that location. Thank you. Okay, other questions? 
All right, I think we don't have any other questions, so we will move to our discussion. And commissioners, I'm starting to request to unmute you so we can close the hearing. All right, and Commissioner Halford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we're gonna begin our discussion. Um, and, and just to sort of provide some context, this is, this is not a scenic landmark, it's a park on, within a historic district that um, we regulate. However, we are advisory um, because the Public Design Commission is binding with respect to all monuments and public art. So our discussion, um, um, both placement and design will be in an advisory capacity that we will then share with the Public Design Commission. Um, Commissioner Chapin, would you like to start this one? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I do appreciate the maintenance issue uh, when I was Deputy Commissioner and was in that particular time was overseeing public art and monuments. Uh, we tried to make sure that monuments in the future uh, would have some maintenance attached to them when they were donated to the Parks Department, since we have a, a, a great number of uh, monuments and many of them do not have any maintenance and uh, attached a fund attached to them. And they are, um, you know, it's, it's a job to make sure that they're well maintained. Uh, I was, I had a few questions after testimony, but I think that the Parks representative did a very good job <clears throat> of addressing uh, those comments, uh, for example, the uh, location, which will it get uh, more viewership than it would in the existing location, and uh, other issues. I think about uh, the. I think that this is appropriate. The uh, landscape of the park; it fits in well with the landscape, and uh, the uh, plaque that the uh, plinth that was originally placed on is not the sort of thing that uh, would be, I think, uh, appropriate at this time. And I, I, it wasn't part of the original design of the park. So I think this, this really is quite appropriate. And I appreciate uh, the clarification of uh, many points, uh, including that this, the uh, Spanish embassy has uh, been involved. So uh, I'm comfortable with this, thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Wow, <laughs> uh, didn't expect that. Um, I, could say I didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition, but I won't. <laughs> um, so I, I think that, I think that the um, um, removal of the granite is uh, appropriate. I think that the um, general placement in a place that has more attention is appropriate. I think that the reaction that uh, I hear may be in some ways related to the kind of informality of this approach versus the formality in placement and form of the previous uh, version. So I, I would suggest, since this is just a, a, a advisory report, that, the, that they consider a, a, uh, a design that is less naturalistic and low to the ground and perhaps more one that is more formal and uh, that see, seeks to emulate the, um, I don't know, scale and uh, sense of gravitas of the previous one um, in, in a better location and with better maintenance options. Okay, but I think you did think that the location was okay. Did you start with that? Yeah, it's it's more or less okay. I think you know you might want to move it around a little bit in the area. I don't, I really don't know the park well okay. enough to say, but I think that you know this this searching for a more formal intervention is not inappropriate, and I, I'm not sure that that's necessarily a landmarks issue, but I think that it is something that they might consider. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I, I agree with Michael on the, the idea of the, the plaque being on a more formal 
base. I mean, I, I just see this thing as it's going to become a seat and people are going to be going by, they're going to take a rest, take their shoes off, spill drinks all over it. I think it should be a, a more formal um, uh, base for the plaque. Um, I'm okay with, with it being moved. Um, and I think it's, it's generally appropriate that, that this modification is taking place. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I, I'm sort of in agreement with the, the two Michaels. I understand the difficulty of the parks department given the limited staff and the limited budget, but I do think the uh, testimonial is correct that we as human beings need to remember, um, you know, the sacrifices. And I, I totally agree that this is formal. This is not meant to be for somebody to sit on. Um, and, and so I really encourage the city and the parks department to come up with additional resources to rethink the placement because what those uh, human beings went through were atrocious, absolutely atrocious, and that gave rise to this, uh, this nation and this city. And so I, I really think that there should be some sort of a dignity and respect pay. And I think that it's unfortunate that the original design was horizontal, that it collected rain and collected all the puddles. And it's very, very hard to, uh, to, uh, to maintain. Uh, but I do think that there is a certain symmetry and axial design that needs to be respected of the original intent, uh, not just a side step. We decide to do relocate somewhere and place a stone there and that's it. Uh, so those okay. are my... Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Bland. Um, well, I was fairly persuaded by the uh, testimony but then pull back to the other side a little bit more by the uh, response to it by the parks department. Uh, I think I'm left still with a feeling of somewhat unease that this, um, this thing kind of cast aside on a boulder, it seems a little demeaning. Um, I was unclear and decided not to ask the question, but I'll just say, I hope that the original <laughs> remains in the uh, visitor center, even with its misspellings, et cetera. I think it's a, a little piece of history in itself. And I, I think it says something to us, which is almost more profound than, than, than this little marker out in the park. So I would be in favor, I think, of what I've just been hearing from uh, my colleagues that somehow this is, it's too casual, too demeaning. And maybe I'm not sure if it's just the location, the size, the placement kind of on the ground near dogs and, and, and soda cans and so forth, but there's something quite, not quite right about it. Uh, so I'm, I'm not totally in favor of what's being proposed yet. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, I would also agree. Uh, with a, a lot of what's been said. This location to me seems very secondary. It, it might be a prominent uh, path to walk on, but there seems to be a disconnect. And if I didn't know what it was all about, I wouldn't be able to make the connection. So um, this plaque, which I don't think should be on a stone, um, I believe needs to be closer to the, you know, the prison ship martyrs memorial. It doesn't, it, it, if for some reason or other, that's a bad location where it is now, uh, then I think it, it should just move so that the connection closer so that it's, so that the, the connection is clearer. I, I completely understand the issues with, um, uh, how it might have been um, constructed in a way that was not um, conducive to its lasting uh, a long period. So now's an opportunity to fix that. And it doesn't have to be horizontal, it can be vertical, but uh, it does need to honor, truly honor in a meaningful way the, the people who gave their lives. And I think it's it should be, a, a clear a clear part of the 
larger story, which it's not in this location. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Jefferson, I think is not available. So we'll go to Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I agree with the prior comments. Um, uh, th this sort of reminds me of the, you know, sort of suburban rock next to the driveway with the house number on it. And, you know, it, it really doesn't put much dignity into it. Um, so um, I, I, I think I agree that it needs to be in a more formal setting. Okay, and Commissioner Jefferson, I think you're back now. Yeah, um, the the original setting, that formal setting, had a certain amount of dignity to it, a certain quality, a certain uh, character, and, and the the issue of technical issues of water and, and water penetration of the monument, those can be resolved. But I uh, I think that that original dignity is what I'm hoping can be preserved. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I think that the fact that the park was not originally designed with an, uh, a marker there, a memorial at that on access with the larger one is, um, it says to me, so, so I'm, I was, that's why I was a little bit confused about the testimony that said that we need, that, that that's the most important thing to um, maintain is that axiality or that relationship where it, it was not an original intent. So I, um, it's a little confusing to me. Well, that says to me that I think that the, that there does not need to be a memorial there. Um, but I do think that in order to continue to um, honor and remember this particular story and these particular people, the, the, as, as everyone's been saying, it's important to, um, to for, for that memorial to be as um, somber and, and um, serious as it can be. And that perhaps a, this, I, I don't think that there's a problem with a, memor with a memorial plaque on a boulder. I just think that the size of this, I mean, there are a lot of different headstone variations of very impressive, massive boulders that have um, bronze plaques embedded on them and in them. And there is no question that they are not, you know, suburban driveway um, address, uh, you know, signs. So I think that it does not have to be um, granite. It does not have to be a square. It does not have to be in the position where it is, but it should have a little bit more um, heft to it, scale to it. Um, and so uh, I think that that's would be my my request is that this thing just grow in in size and in and in presence um, in the park somewhere. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, I agree with a lot of the comments that have already been said. Um, I think that the placing the the plaque on this boulder is is too casual a commemoration for this um, for these events. And I think the more formal setting is more appropriate. Um, I I actually would really love to see it in its existing location, and perhaps that granite base could be tilted up, and so it wasn't completely horizontal, and a replica could be made in the same location. Um, I understand that it has flaws, but perhaps <clears throat> it could be a different material, and it could be referenced that the fact that the original is in the visitor center to be seen. Um, but I, 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 I think that the, the small plaque on a boulder is, is not really appropriate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for a very good discussion, commissioners. So I'll go ahead and make a motion for this advisory report that sort of captures the essence of our um, recommendations. So, um, in the matter of docket number LPC 2106414, Fort Greene Park in the Fort Greene Historic District, a 19th century park built in 1840 and altered in 1866 to 73 by Olmsted and Vox, and in 1906 to 1909 by McKim, Mead, and White. This is an application to install a boulder and replace a plaque. 
and I um, am recommending that we issue a report finding that the proposed removal of the granite base and the installation of a new uh, plaque will not eliminate or damage any significant historic or architectural features of the park, that the presence of memorial signage will relate well to the history of this park, which features a historic tomb, a prominent monument, and ceremonial spaces. And um, however, I, uh, the commissioner's comments um, surrounding this proposed uh, monument, um, I think are recommending that the um, Parks Department reconsider the design to, um, to propose a more formal approach to the design scale and setting of the new monument. Okay, and uh, Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 11 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. All right, so that uh, we will be issuing that report um, and we will uh, now, I think, break for lunch. We are a little behind schedule and so we um, will resume at 1.30 and we will um, pick up where we left off with item public hearing item number four and then we will continue with the rest of the afternoon items. So um, commissioners, just turn your camera and audio off. All members of the public, we'd ask you to actually exit the meeting now and um, re-enter the meeting at 1.30. Thanks.